Yeah, yeah. Of course, because we went with that yeah. tree on the top of that. I just warned me. <laughs> Welcome to day two of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement 2024 National Convention. No more genocide in our name. No more genocide. In our name. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so yesterday was really profound. And today we have a fully packed day with more revolutionary speakers. We have a tour of the Black Power Blueprint projects and some really amazing workshops that you don't want to miss. So I'd like to start by saluting USM's leadership, the African People's Socialist Party. Chairman Omali Yeshatela, <laughs> Deputy Chair Onazine Yeshatela, um, Chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee, Penny Hess, and Chair of USM, Jesse Neville. Yes, Uhuru. And I'd like to thank and salute everyone that is here today, everyone that attended yesterday that came to the Uhuru House from across the country that joined from across the world online. Yesterday was incredible. We raised over $20,000 in one day. <laughs> $20,440 in reparations for the anti-colonial projects of the party. Uhuru. Um, and we also won 10 members. Uhuru. <laughs> um, so this, it really shows and it proves how powerful African internationalism is and how transformative it is and how people want to unite with it. And that when white people hear the message of the party and the chairman and understand colonialism as the central contradiction of our time, and that we can help overturn the colonial mode of production with the way to do that being to join in material solidarity with the African working class, with colonized people and to fight for reparations under the revolutionary leadership of the APSP. So I unite with this. I'm excited. I know that you unite too. So we have a goal today to win 10 more members and we can do that. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and I'd like to also just remind people that at any point today when you feel inspired to unite in material solidarity with the African working class, with the anti-colonial resistance, you can go for the first time or you can go back to uhurusolidarity.org slash pay dash reparations and donate, become a member and join under the revolutionary leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. So I would like to now thank the our endorsers for the convention. So many organizations wanted to unite with APSP's program of reparations with um, African and indigenous and Palestinian liberation. And these include the Green Party of St. Louis, Veterans for Peace, African National Women's Organization, Universal African People's Organization, Women Against Military Madness, Homes for All St. Louis, International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, Center for Political Innovation, Green Party Peace Action Committee, Green Party of Kansas City, Interfaith Committee on Latin America, Committees One Project St. Louis, Missouri, Party of Communists USA, American Student Union, San Jose Peace and Justice Center, the United National Anti-War Coalition, Journey for Justice, Real Progressives, and Missouri Cure. So thank you to the endorsers of Huru. <laughs> I would like to remind people to make sure that your phones are turned to silent. The restrooms are located on the wall to your left there. And today, lunch will be at 1230. And there is a sign-up sheet that is in the back and going around to sign up to go to the trial in September. So please find that and sign up. Drop the charges. Ah. All right. Thank you. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started today. And we will have the honor of hearing from Secretary General of the African People's Socialist Party and Chair of the Hands Off Uhuru Fight Back Coalition, Moise Odom, on the significance of the solidarity front of the African Revolution. Welcome, SJ Moise. <laughs> Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, comrades. I um, want to really appreciate 
um, that warm welcome and introduction. I think hope that's good there from uh, Comrade Lauren and really want to just salute and appreciate uh, day two of the USM National Convention. And I want to um, salute my leadership, Chairman Amalia Shatella and Deputy Chair Owner Zanaya Shatella, and um, just the remarkable work of the party in its um, in its formation of this really important um, aspect of the, you know, a strategy for liberation, which is the Solidarity Front. And um, just a few things I wanted to just um, unite with um, about meeting the goal and 10 members, and here we are, the goal and the challenge is to multiply that today. Wow. And I really want to um, just uh, unite with the strategy of the Solidarity Front um, in its representation of this mass movement of USM and just hearing from the list of endorsers and you know understanding the character of each of those organizations is the struggle for so for uh, social justice, for peace, for reparations, for seeing a world that is environmentally friendly, all of these things. And so this this is all what the solidarity looks like um, because this is um, rooted, in what the African People's Socialist Party was founded on and has always been about was the struggle against colonialism. And, and you know, if it weren't for colonialism, we would not have to be struggling for all these various um, things that we wanna see change in the world. This is, this is where it started. And I really wanna um, salute Chairman Amalia Shatella for you know, bringing this theory to the world in your relentless struggle to, um, to, you know, to spread this, around the world so that we can adopt this and we can take this in as our own. And we as the people can um, understand that um, we have something to fight for in this too. So um, just wanted to say that. And I did want to just say a few things about yesterday because I do want to also give a brief summation of day one and I hope you'll keep me on time. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Uhuru. Um, <clears throat> wanted to also salute uh, comrade uh, Jamie, um, you know, as the MC, and also wanted to really salute uh, Comrade Amanda uh, for that really powerful, uh, you know, dedication statement on yesterday. And yes, Uhuru, Uhuru. And, and for those who are watching online, um, if you have not gone um, to see day one, you got to go back because it was really powerful. And you would have also heard from uh, Comrade Makeda, who gave really powerful um uh, you know, presentation um, just poured her heart out, really. And, you know, it, it I was speechless and I didn't cry <laughs> because, you know, on the outside. But it's clear that, you know, our crying and our tears is represented um, in the only way that it should be, which should be in concrete practice to overturn, right? Not just I feel bad, but, but like the party is doing something about that. And um, really wanted to just salute our revolutionary cultural workers uh, now and then, right, because have always been under attack and on the front as well. And um, this is also part of how we take this, you know, struggle out is we bring our whole selves into this process. And um, and another cultural worker, John McCarthy, you made me think, we, you know, we got to have like a stand up section, <laughs> of, you know, <laughs> it was just a great way to articulate you know, just the world and what's happening and in a really um, <laughs> creative way. So uh -huh. that's an action item. <laughs> and um, Chairwoman Penny just wanted to really salute you, um, comrade, and your, um, uh, even just, just your leadership in this process with the, you know, with the fight back and bringing in the solidarity front, um, even our relationship with the Leonard Peltier Ad Hoc Committee. And, um, helping to really, um, you know, lead that in a way and, um, you know, founded on the principle that the oppression of um, the indigenous people on this land um, is, uh, and I just want to tell people to read the book, The Culture of Violence, that was, you know, that is the foundation of African internationalism and, you know, uh, led by the chairman and, and written by Chairman Penny. You'll, you know, just really understand the importance of the African and indigenous um, you know, history and our, you know, this shared struggle. So, um, and I think that um, wanted to also, which we're going to hear from after me, so I won't go into it too much yet, but Deputy Chair Owners and Ayesha Tella, we're going to go on a tour today. So we're going to get a chance to see the institutions on the ground and really um, get to feel uh, what this organization is about and what we are building for. 
And um, and again, just the panels and everything was just really powerful. So go back to day one. That's all I'll say for now. But I did want to also, um, before we close, <clears throat> uh, just talk about the importance of APSC and you know the party's effort to win you know, an anti-colonial and independence position subsequent to the work by Chairman Amalia Chatella, which deepened the theoretical basis for the strategy and the significance of APSC in the African Revolution. And these are just some, some key points taken from the chairman's writings, but the, par the, the purpose of the Solidarity Committee is to, you know, is it represents a concrete, um, you know, reflection of the party's theoretical understanding on the question of colonialism. We are, you know, dialectic. And so there cannot be, if there is a colonized, there has to be a colonizer. We have to be able to say that and, and point that out because otherwise it's just this abstract thing why black people can never get it together or why the indigenous people are never seen or why, you know, there's always problems in the, you know, in Africa, it's always black on black and all this stuff, right? And so, but this through colonialism, it created a very violent and parasitic relationship between African and, uh, and other colonized people and the colonizer. And, you know, the only way as we talked about that you can keep a people oppressed is, um, you know, just this colonial violence. And one thing the chairman has taught us about is um, like horizontal and vertical violence. And I don't know, that just really opened it up for me because this, you know, violence that comes down from the state, right? By keeping the people oppressed and by starving us and, um, terrorizing us. This is what then makes it that when the people resist, because you would want to resist, there's no, that is the natural thing to do. When you resist, you, you know, you know, we see our leaders get assassinated. Um, we see our leaders get imprisoned. Um, you know, we lose our jobs, right? Or just all these things that happen. And part of that then is the people, you know, then you see, um, you know, um, horizontal violence. So we're fighting our own resources and we're, you know, with the little breadcrumbs that we have. And so this is the dynamic that has been created because of colonialism. We have a, um, it is a solvable problem. If it got that way, the way to undo it is to restore that relationship. And so this is what the importance is for APSC um, with the, you know, with the liberation struggle for African people but also the liberation struggle for all people. And that's what you're a part of as well. And so you can, you can say that you support African revolution because you support the right for the Palestinian people to have their land. You can say that you support the African liberation struggle because this is directly tied to the oppression of the indigenous people on this land um, you know, and the genocide. And you can say that too of any other liberation struggle and any, any type of oppression gender oppression, and you know, whatever it is, it came from colonialism and this is how we undo it. So I just wanted to say, this is um, what this, this, this relationship is and the potential that it has for us to grow. So let's get two new, 10, 10 new members plus more today. Um, and let's um, have a great day too. And I'm going to, I think Lauren might introduce our next speaker. Okay, great. But I do want to, um, yeah. So Lauren will in, um, in, introduce our next speaker. So. What the last thing I'll say is um, let's continue to deepen this, um, this relationship and be, thank you, and be very um, intentional about how our relationships will change um, and are changing, but this is the relationship that we want to be able to deepen um, and, and see reflected in the world. So let's get back to, um, to humanity, um, however you see it, and um, I want to say Uhuru. And uh, what do we say? Give me something. <laughs> so many cheers, so, so many chants. Vanguard up, there we go. Uhuru, relentless, relentless. From, from sea, let's go. From sea to shining sea. Indigenous people must be free. From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Uhuru. Unity through? <laughs> Thank you, Secretary General Mwezi. That was a wonderful presentation that really explained the significance 
of our role as white people working under the leadership of the African working class to answer the call of the party, to win reparations from the white community to the African economic institutions that build economic power in the African community, which is the fight to end colonialism for all people. And I do want to announce that since the program started, we now have 11 new members. Um, so we're progressing quickly here. So let's keep it going. Okay. Um, and next in our program, we will get to hear more about the brilliant programs of the Black Power Blueprint from the architect of these economic institutions, building dual and contending power um, and African self-determination. So it's an honor to introduce African People's Socialist Party Deputy Chair and President of the African People's Education and Defense Fund, Mona Zinea Shatela. <laughs> Uhura comrades. So the day is finally come. We're going to actually see the manifestation of our work in practical terms, as the chairman always say, which is very important because it's not what we say, but what we do. You know, you hear people all over, you know, different organizations, you know, they talk a good talk, but they have not produced anything. And the African People's Education and Defense Fund, the African People's Socialist Party, is a talking organization, but we're also a practical organization that actually manifests uh, our work into um, actual programs. And I really want to really salute the chairman for that because everything that you see today is based off a political report, you know, uh, to the African People's Socialist Party or through our Congresses. Our leadership gives us directions on what we should be doing and I take that very seriously because, you know, uh, just, you know, of myself, I would not be able to do it. So having the direction of, uh, of my leadership, Chairman O'Malley, has helped me to, you know, put these things into play. So I just want to say quickly, because I know I don't have a lot of time, is that uh, I was sent here to St. Louis in 2017, and there were three goals that the chairman uh, wanted me to accomplish. And one was to locate an Ahura house, which you are sitting in right now. <laughs> and the second thing was to find, uh, locate a solidarity center, which I think everybody has been to the solidarity center on um, Friday. I think people have seen the solidarity center. And the third thing was to locate um, uh, a location for Ahura Foods and Pies for the GECO kitchen. And we've done that as well. So we were able to accomplish all three goals. Uh, right now, we are in the process of um, building a Huru Bakery and Cafe right on this tour you'll be able to see. Uh, one of the things that we realized was that uh, people had not seen or have tasted our food. You know, we're based, uh, our foods are based out of California as well as Florida. So what we decided to do was to open up a smaller uh, bakery and cafe. And so people can, you know, come in and start tasting our food. So, and then we can also raise the resources that we need to finish the uh, building on Natural Ridge and Goodfellow. So I, you know, I thought it was a really great strategy. And I think that it's going to work out really great because people will be able to, um, we'll do pop-ups there. We'll have different, um, chefs that come there and cook for us so we can raise money. We can do Sula Market. We can do um, Forest Hill. We can do all the different markets to get our food out and let people know who we are and, you know, get a taste of our foods and pies, which have been around for the past 40 years. So we're very, very excited about that. So I wanted to just read, um, because as I stated before, everything that, um, I do um, in the economic work is based on uh, a political report or, or, or something. So uh, putting revolution back on the agenda again was written uh, by Chairman Amali Shatella in 2017. And I just wanna read a, just a couple of paragraphs from that report that really helped to guide, you know, what we're gonna be seeing uh, today on the tour. Okay, so it says Africans must must be influenced to continue to combine with each other to begin grabbing up properties that have been abandoned and discarded in our community as part of the process of chasing us out. 
undermining property values and opening the door to vultures from the colonizing nation to easy, cheap acquisition. We must help the people to understand that groups of Africans coming together can begin to acquire property in the community through economic cooperation. We can also create housing and other kinds of economic cooperatives. This can be a part of the foundation for cooperative socialist influence e economics. Our political task is to teach the people to be contemptuous of any kind of dependency. Moving forward, the Office of the Deputy Chair must consider how to expand the anti-colonial economic leadership beyond the immediate institutions of the party. All of our party leaders and most of our committees and organization must incorporate this message into your propaganda. This will help to truly ground our work for a long haul. It will help to give our work the kind of strategic approach necessary to win because, because it keeps our vision fixed on economic op um, objectives of our political work. We must also develop the ability to host community meetings throughout our base areas within the U.S. and elsewhere and teach Africans how to deal with the basic economic issues. This should include everything from how to do personal and family budgets to how to initiate businesses, including business plans and the acquisition of startup capital by collectivizing resources or individual savings, et cetera. The Office of the Deputy Chair should also develop a proposal that could that would call on members and leaders of the party and all of our mass work to spend time in our economic institutions. This would allow the entire party and movement to understand the relationship to the economic work and the institutions to the political agenda of the party. It would also contribute to the per permission of the discipline and organization inherent to the economic work throughout the party and all of our institutions. So, you know, the chairman, you know, he's laid it out for um, what should be happening, not just here in St. Louis, but all the different areas that we're located. You know, um, the economic work is located in um, St. Petersburg, Florida, Philadelphia, Calif Oakland, California, and beyond. So we want to, and we, and we have economic institutions, you know, all over um, the U.S. So he has laid it out for what we should be accomplishing right now. And I think that uh, on this tour, you would see uh, his words being manifested through the practical work that we have, you know, laid out in this in this tour. So I'm very excited to uh, get started. Um, Jesse, should we just line up and get ready? <laughs> All right, so everybody should have a map and this map uh, shows all the different places that we have built and are building economic uh, institutions. And the number one is the Hoover House where we're sitting at right now. And I just wanna say when I came here in 2017, uh, we found this location and this location was an abandoned building that had been left here for at least 30 years. So what you see now is not what you what, what was here uh, in 2017. So we remodeled this whole building, um, first floor, second floor, and we have a third floor for, with our conference room. We also have a basement here. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to imagine when you're actually here and you see it like this, you can't imagine what it looked like before. And usually what I would do on a tour is give a, a presentation about the, uh, the before pictures of all the work that has been done, but we don't have time for that today. So we're just gonna get started and we'll kind of tell you about things as we go on the tour. Uhuru. Uhuru. Did you want to say anything, Chairman? Okay. Uhuru. All right, comrades. I guess the only, the only thing, other thing I would say is that uh, well, I really appreciate uh, the explanation that uh, the comrade deputy chair gave for this. As she mentioned, uh, she's working from a report, uh, a, a political report uh, to our, our, what was that, the second plenary 
Was that the second plenary of our sixth Congress? Which was that? Yeah, it was 2017, it's the plenary that we had. It was following one of our Congresses. And that, the, the first of all, the Congress had, uh, all the membership of the party had voted on this political report. So it was the people's political report. And then uh, the deputy chair, uh, then we moved uh, to the plenary and talked about how it was going to be carried out. That's what this talked about. And the deputy chair took that and, and that was voted on uh, by the organization. So it's not just something that an individual just ran off and did. It was a collective process. And I think that's really important to understand. Uhuru. I just want to announce really quick that this will be about 90 minutes, so use the restroom if you need to. There will be two cars at the end of the tour if people feel like they can't make it back, but please let James know. He's got the megaphone if you don't think you'll be able to walk on the tour. Agreed. Oh, and for people online, we are taking the tour with us, so stay tuned. It'll be very exciting. <laughs>
my boss at night. No, I'm going to take my car and get a, a rental. He was with the element of the person. This was uh, purchased from a private owner. Um, five thousand square feet uh, from top to bottom, and we renovated the whole thing um, on 2018. I think completed it on. June of 2018, yeah. we actually had the first two conference in this building that it was renovated. So, you know, like an anniversary uh, type thing for us. So we're going to go ahead and move next door. But before we go there, um, there were two commercial buildings that had been abandoned for like 25 years on this, on this property that we're going to visit. And we uh, couldn't, uh, re couldn't remodel those buildings. So we demolish those buildings. So that was a big, big deal. And uh, we decided that we were going to make it an outdoor venue and also make it the home of uh, Gary Brooks Community Garden. And Mr. Gary Brooks is actually um, the gentleman that's on the uh, mural that we just sent to the law. Mr. Jim, and he also lived in that building for a very, very long time. And he, when I first got here, he really helped us um, you know, because we had no lights, no water, no electricity uh, during this process. So he would let us use his electricity, his water. He would cook breakfast for us. He would just really, he was just, you know, he became united with what we were doing in the community. And he saw the changes, uh, you know, that he realized that we were going to stay in this community and not be, because as you know, my ground was burdened in 2014. And all the news people were here on the ground here, right up the street in Burlington. And the chairman, when the chairman came, uh, it made a whole difference. Yeah, just I think that's uh, worth mentioning because uh, after the killing of Mike Brown, it uh, sparked real serious concern by the United States government. Uh, that uprising was incredible. And uh, you may have seen pictures of Africans uh, who were facing armored vehicles and things like that, all kinds of uh, military equipment that was exposed uh, that was there. This is when uh, Palestinians saw the same kind of relationship in terms of resistance, saying this is how you have tear gas, they were sending messages and things like that. Uh, so that was really important. And the, it really shocked the government. So. All kinds of forces were sent. Parachute did the first. Uh, Soros brought millions and billions of dollars. They, they purchased uh, people. That's where they promoted the whole Black Lives Matter thing. And uh, Zuckerberg and everybody, that became the slogan. Uh, but that wasn't a slogan. That wasn't a slogan that first kicked off when they killed Mike Brown. Left him uh, rotting uh, on that 100 plus degree uh, uh, asphalt. People were chanting, Kill the police. That was the slogan. Kill the police. They had identified an enemy. It was unambiguous. This was a relationship we have with the police every day. And so these are just kids walking down the street. I mean, just walking down the street. It's not like there was traffic or anything like that. And the cops rolled up on them like they always do. So what happened with Mike Brown was usual. And so the, that was the response for people uh, to the colonial conditions and the colonial military force in our military. Then uh, they said, you have to be here to yeah. understand. They, they were even quite missionaries who were preaching on the streets and who were passing out. I, I was in debate, debating them in the crowds and stuff like that. And uh, uh, and and uh, Martin Luther King's daughter uh, was parachuted in, and just all kinds of nonsense. Oh, I mean, there, I think there were more sellouts in Ferguson, per square inch, than any place else in the country at that time. So they were all brought in. 
And then, uh, and like I said, the Soros, they had, I don't know if they had purchased that building, but they occupied a huge building. All these people who they were training to be what they, they call community organizers, like Barack Hussein Obama yeah. was a quote unquote community organizer, right? And so, uh, but uh, when, the, when the media left, they left, we stayed. I mean, uh, we were participating in marches because thousands of people were so full of you know, revolutionary organizations and nobody had a clipboard or took a name. Nobody was trying to organize with us, right? And so we built uh, as this thing was going on. And uh, and the other thing I think is really important to mention is that uh, uh, Commander Patel was talking about uh, uh, the old man up here, uh, Gary Brooks. Uh, he he was a skeptic when we first got here. He really had no confidence in what we were doing, what the how the community would relate to it, and what have you. He was gone. Like the people were gone to practice what it is that we were doing in relationship to what we say and what we do. And that's the fundamental question. So I just wanted to make that point. So we're going to go ahead and move over, basically. We can't hear. Oh. Okay. okay, so we're going to go ahead and move over to Karibo and also to the Gary Brooks group. Um, yeah. So just about to say, uh, a big two uh, commercial buildings on this property that we developed. And now look at the beautiful state of the art venue that we can have weddings, birthday parties, music events. We built the state of our stage here, and we have a beautiful garden in the, in the summertime, but right now it's winter and uh, everything is, you know, closed down. But come here in May or June, you'll see how beautiful everything is really uh, done. On the wall, our mural was done by Jamie, the artist, who actually moved here from uh, Birmingham, Alabama. She moved to St. Louis after completing this mural. So that's Mr. Gary to the left, actually Kingy in the middle, Abdul to the right. And we just wanted something that represented food and where food came from, which originates from Africa. So this is what we came up with. We have the beautiful um, panel boxes that have all kinds of uh, collard greens, onion, uh, kale, everything that you can imagine, tomatoes, uh, fresh onions. We have apple trees, peach trees along here. We have a rainscape garden on the back of the stage that was uh, we put in last year. So this is a beautiful outdoor venue. Beautiful stage where we have performances and um, all kinds of events out here. So this is really beautiful. Any questions? <laughs> Everybody, you can just walk around and see things. You don't have to just stand in one place, you know. Uh, like I said, we have peach and apple trees, which is, you know, that's going to be growing this summer. We have the rainscape garden to the left. And we have tulips that are going to be coming up pretty soon. I mean, it's a beautiful, of course, and we have the uh, African flag kind of still this morning because. <laughs> it's wrapped up just like us right now because of the weather. It's very cold, by the way. You got it. Come. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and walk. And as a matter of fact, this building where the mural is is part of our um, property acquisition. So we own this building now, and uh, we'll be taking possession of it in uh, early April. So um, we're really excited about that. We got this building through a tax sale. Um, 
and we were able to uh, to uh, purchase it. What are you going to do with it? I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know yet. We just got it. So. You know, we wanted to keep the trajectory going with the property acquisition, and it's right next door to yeah. what we, where we are. So it just seemed to fit perfect. So we'll announce, we'll be announcing Red Bear, you know, where it's, what it's going to be to the future. So we're going to keep going down the street. Did you mention about the irrigation from the grant? That, no. Oh, okay. No, I just wanted to let people know that this drip irrigation system put in as a, we had that, uh, it's a St. Louis Business Council, Regional Business Council, and we were able to get the irrigation and the and the some of the rain garden from that. Thank you. Let me make them uh, Yeah, it might be worth mentioning that um, initially uh, uh, farmers market that now is in the park, park. O'Fallon Park, a few blocks away, was uh, established here. And uh, some irony uh, must be associated with the fact uh, that the United States government that is now uh, trying to put bus, taking money from the Russians, uh, the United States government actually through the USDA funded the uh, you know, the farmer's market that yeah. we have here. For three years. Three years. So I don't know if the United States government is working for the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they funded this because the USDA, they are bureaucracy. They have to explain uh, also and justify the <laughs> programs that they have. So they have this program uh, for, uh, for having these farmer's markets. And so they say, you know, you put in, uh, you know, like a proposal uh, to do it, we put in a proposal and, and our proposal is good. Like almost yeah. everything like that we do, it was solid. So then the, the, the government ends up funding this thing, right? It was one of the best, you know, uh, proposals that they had. It was the proposal uh, among all the other so-called farmers markets, ours is in the top of in terms of meeting the requirements of the grant. And this is the government that's putting us in prison uh, for keeping their ass uh, solid. And these are the pro 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 proposals that they put out to justify the, the other kinds of stuff that they do. So I just think that's important to acknowledge. So this is who they're putting in prison. And the fact is, I saw Malcolm X doing an interview not too long ago. He was being interviewed by the FBI. And they were charging, they were wondering uh, uh, whether or not uh, he was, uh, the government should be following him and, and doing these things. And Malcolm said, I'm doing your work. Right. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> you know, I'm the one who's uh, keeping the prisons, uh, uh, black people from going to prison and you know, doing all these other kinds of things. And the truth of the matter is, the government should be awarding us, yeah. you know, yeah. because if you look at all of this devastation that's here, we are the ones who are changing them. And the government claims to be uh, an institution that's uh, working for in the interest of the people. We are, and they're attacking us for in, working in the interest of the people. So where's the crime and who is the criminal? Yeah. 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 So we're going to go out the gate and make a left. Just a time check. Okay, yeah. Got to get What what people uh what people should understand about uh and generally speaking, but uh there's some specifics to the process and policy of deterioration that's happening in St. Louis. It's it's typical, uh much of it in terms of uh communities uh all African communities all around this country. 
and this Mexican community, the whole process of uh, pushing even uh, in this corridor. Uh, but uh, in 1972, the city of St. Louis, uh, uh, through a program devised by the Rand Corporation, and they put something together called Team Four. And, and the Team Four plan was something that was to carry out uh, uh, a process that uh, this man Monahan, uh, who became a senator out of New York, uh, put uh, called uh, benign neglect uh, for this community, for the black community. It was purposely designed. Uh, There are also abandoned property, and this is going to be, and this is going to be part of uh, this building that we just acquired. We're going to be going inside up here. We just acquired this building, and we're thinking about moving the who are So we we it was tons and tons of so far. This is kind of what the horror house looked like, but not in this great condition. Yeah, this, is much better, uh, this yeah. is much better than the horror house that we were in just now. And then upstairs, we have about 10 different offices upstairs. So we're really excited about this project. <laughs> I hope it's the last project that we have to do like this. <laughs> but uh, we couldn't pass this up. This is a LRA property. This property, we acquired this property for, I think, about $2,000. And um, now we're going to use it to uh, benefit the community. So we're very, very excited about, about uh, renovating this uh, particular property. And I just want to say that we purchased it from LRA and then they rescinded the offer. Uh, they say that they called me up and said that they got a call from someone that said that we were indicted, that we were under investigation. So we held a press conference and we went to their board meeting and they rescinded the rescind. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, they say they made a clerical error, you know, in telling us that we couldn't have it. So uh, we end up with it. We just purchased this um, last year, the end of last year. So we're very excited. We don't have time to go upstairs, but like I said, it's about 10 different offices upstairs that we also demo the whole thing upstairs through that uh, way right there. And it's a very beautiful building. And I'm sure that uh, we'll be asking you to come and have work days with us to help make it happen. Right so we're gonna keep going down the street The big chair, how many, how many uh, truckloads of stuff did they collect? Yeah. yeah. And he can see the view. Yeah. yeah. How many truckloads of stuff is there? Oh my God. Be nice to see more. Oh, yeah. Who was it? Um, it was probably about. We had two dumpsters and a probably about twenty different truckloads that had to be uh, uploaded out of this building. 
can you imagine this building has been sitting probably at least 20 years yeah. and you know people homeless people have been you know living here and and accumulate all kinds of things in, in, uh, from this building. So we're excited that the Black Power Blueprint is going to be taking uh, taking this on and making it uh, just as beautiful as the whorehouse down the street. Wow. Or, yeah. Right. So we're going to keep going, Congress. I'm getting time check. Okay. Yeah, we're getting time check. One hour and five minutes. <laughs> So you can see which one of the property owned by the other person who was indicted a couple of years ago. He owned this property and he put a sign out saying that he was going to put a community garden here and look at it. You know, they have cut it, but you can see all the trash and stuff out here. I know it may be like a question of whether he can own this property. Okay, right here, <clears throat> is, we own from this corner all the way to the end corner down here. So we own this entire block. And this is where we're going to put the Black Power Square a retail. Yeah. Okay, so we own from this corner to the very end corner, and this is where we're going to put the Black Power Square Retail and Development Center, made out of shipping containers. So we're really excited about this project because, as we know, commerce brings resources to the community, and that's what this business center is going to be doing. Wow. Yeah. So from here all the way down to the next corner. We own that. Wow. And that was, this was another land that they tried to take back from us along with that building and we want it back. Right. So be careful walking down here. Yeah. Sorry, that's that's to the corner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, just not. Just enough to be correct. <laughs> you got another so we whole just put up here. this temporary fence you know, because people, what they do is they come and dump stuff on your pro on the property. So we put up a temporary fence so we're able to start construction. So from that corner, so from all the way from that corner to this corner, we own it. And that's the right. That's and now we're going to cross the street to the basketball court. Okay. Again, um, we're at the uh, Black Power Vanguard basketball court, and again, we there were two buildings, abandoned buildings on this property. We had to demolish these buildings and we made a state of the art basketball court. I want everybody to go inside and see it. It's beautiful. And Jamie, the artist, she did the, this mural as well. Look how beautiful that is. Thank you. The beautiful mural was designed by Jamie the artist. As I said, Jamie has moved her family here from Birmingham, Alabama. So the material, the court material is called sport court. The material that's on the surface here. And we wanted the best. Um, Stephen Curry out of uh, Oakland, I think he's in Oakland. 
um, he designed his basketball courts made of this sport court material. So we had um, gotten together with Sport Coat to have them design our basketball court as well. And we put this down because we wanted the, it to be easy on the knees and the feet for the kids that are playing basketball. Yeah, look at people. <laughs> it's very, it's very state of the art. And of course, it's red, black, and green. And, and the center is our logo, which is Black Power Vanguard. Um, that was designed by Rich Piahidra. So that we yeah. right. Well, it's starting to get wear and tear because people are playing on the court. <laughs> yeah. 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 On all of our properties, we're we're gonna uh, put up the red, black, and green, so people know that it's it's home of the African people's education and defense fund and the Black Power Blueprint. So we have benches. We have uh, in the corner. We have uh, where basketballs uh, can go and just stay if there is a tournament or something. They can store their basketball court. Their basketballs there. So yeah, it's a state of the art. Beautiful. We have bleachers, right? Bleachers, oh yeah. Uh, we have bleachers, but we haven't uh, cemented them in the ground, but they'll go in the back here, in back of the fence. Uh, we have two sets of bleachers that we're gonna uh, put down as well. Everybody's so quiet. Yeah, you're, you're right. right. <laughs> So, you know, uh, people always say, you know, where where does the money go that I donate? You know, where does it go? This is where the this is where it goes. You know, every cent. Um, it took us one hundred and sixty thousand dollars to build this court. And we got donations of five dollars, ten dollars, up to fifty thousand uh, dollars from donors to contribute to help make this happen. So uh, the kids are very excited and we're gonna be having uh, programs this summer and we are excited to to move it forward. Yeah, I want to say that not only are the children very happy because uh, there's some pretty big kids <laughs> who, are, who are out here on this court. The other thing is that there are sectors including the person who was the alderman here who tried to keep this from happening. And they were saying that if you put up the basketball yeah. court, that uh, they'd be shooting and killing each other, what have you, the typical trope that's put out to justify like having, you know, a military occupation of community. In fact, the same older person had once called uh, for National Guards to be sent into this community to control this community. Mm -hmm. So they tried to keep it, the guy, one of the other neighbors here, tried to keep it from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think, and then somebody has raised the question, of why would you put a basketball court there, right? Uh, I mean, it's all these things that you can do, but the basketball court doesn't make any resources for anything like that. But you put a basketball court there because uh, we were inspired because the children were playing basketball in the streets. Mm -hmm. And you see this in every African community that you can go and that make shift boots, you know, that they put there. And the children need to be able to see something bigger and be able to aspire for a different kind of life and lifestyle and know that there's poss other possibilities. You do it because you want the children to be able to see the sky mm -hmm. and not have their, you know, their worldview limited by the circumstances that they've been trapped in, what have you. So that's why you put a basketball court here. And the fact is that when Jamie the artist was out here working before there was any fence here, and Jamie, the artist, was out here working on this, uh, on that mural. People would actually line up in their cars mm -hmm. and just watch the artist. Mm -hmm. And on one occasion, at least a person jumped out of the car and gave her a $100 bill. Mm -hmm. They were so happy to see the mm -hmm. kind of changes being made in this community uh, that went against everything the colonizers have been doing to us. That's why you put a basketball court here. As uh, people came from down the street, they would take pictures. And they would uh, say, I want you to come and look at what we are trying to do over here. This is the kind of thing that, that we've done. We transformed this entire community. Uh, we're in the process of doing that. That's the struggle against colonialism. 
That's the thing they hate. That's how they will attack us at 5 o'clock in the morning because we show the people there's an alternative. There's an alternative. The Democratic Party, all the fucking politicians were against what we were doing. Yeah. Except for one. That was Jesse Todd. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just like... <laughs> Jesse Todd was the only one of the of the all the persons, only one in government that not only did not fight against us, but had his own program that he had tried to implement for years and years to do some of the same stuff we are doing right here, and he had to fight, and he couldn't even make that happen. So, so they all worked against us. They don't want this kind of transformation to happen. That's why they would attack us. They don't want to say that there's an alternative to Joe Biden. Uh, uh, and Donald Trump and the rest of them. But it is not people can do anything we want to do, and we build the relationships. You know, we destroy these artificial barriers that have been put before the people, right? They're not absolutely artificial, but they can be made uh, to, to be, they can be destroyed and disappeared. And that's what's happening. That's what your presence here means. That's what the convention that we're here, you know, represent as well. Okay, yeah. so we're going to we're going to move on inside. This is the fourplex that we actually purchased from a private owner. And this is where uh, the African Independent Workforce Program is going to be. And this is where we're going to have men and women coming out of the colonial prison system. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at that. And we're going to go ahead and move up the street. For us. You're a little roll guard back there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, stand, you stand. I'll see you on <laughs> So come on in. This is the first uh, apartment downstairs. The apartment downstairs are for the men. We have two apartments downstairs that's dedicated for men, and we have two apartments upstairs that are dedicated for the women. Come on in and come on through. <laughs> How you doing? Good. <laughs> so, like I said, um, these apartments were furnished by Hulu Furniture and Collectibles. They drove over 900 miles to bring all the furniture you see inside of here. And all the appliances were a grant that we got from JD Chef. So come on in. Are those open? You can go. We're going through. Oh, we're going through not yeah, everything's open inside. <laughs> I saw, I saw this person up there chastised them. Who the hell is this person, right? <laughs> so as everybody knows, um, in my presentation, I said that these houses are made out from a funding lake, all four, um, the whole complex. And then we have uh, different apartments named after African leaders. So we dedicated this ap these apartments on August 19th of last year. So come on in, comrades. <laughs> So this is Mufundi and his wife, Carolyn. We have like pictures of him throughout each apartment. People can go on through, each apartment has living room, dining room, kitchen, bathroom, and bedroom. So you could just make your way on around to the next apartment as well. I just want to say like the deputy chair offered this explanation for why the men stay downstairs yeah. and the women stay upstairs. And she, <laughs> she said, this is because if anything happens, see, the men are downstairs that can defend it. And the women are upstairs. But when you get upstairs, you see the real reason. <laughs> <laughs> so we're All the apartments are beautiful. But yes, we are partial to the women. <laughs> So come on team comrades, we got to keep it moving. We only have less than an hour for this tour. So uh, the second apartment is to your right. There's bedrooms straight ahead, the bathroom to your left. 
Any of them, upstairs here or next door, wherever you want to go, these restrooms that you have to go. This is the time to go because with the last restroom break. Yeah, come on through, comrade. All the beds are new. It is one of the bed bugs, so all the beds are brand new, but everything else is from a whole furniture. Everything else is from a whole furniture and collectively. And Ikea curtains. <laughs> <laughs> So, we'll move on so it, it can have 16 people then. You know. No, two in each one. So we have four that's eight. Eight. Yes. Um, well, again, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, our furniture store, so we have a moving company called Who Run Moving. So they drove all the furniture you see in all four apartments down from Philadelphia, 900 miles. <laughs> and a snowstorm. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah, it was really fantastic. But, and you will see uh, within the Who Furniture, we had a line called Enzo, and we painted uh, pieces of old furniture here. Uh, and each apartment has a signature piece in it. So that's pretty. And then the pillows as well to match. So we can go upstairs. <laughs> we can go upstairs to the women's section. There's yes. also the hand painted furniture, the only at the group yeah. furniture. Yeah. Okay, so the hand painted furniture with the African design that's something that Uhuru Furniture initiated. And you know, popularize that kind of mm -hmm. style with really taking beautiful African art and applying it and making it affordable. Um, you know, beautiful, affordable furniture with African design. That was something that people really wanted at the Ruby Furniture. And what's your name? Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> and who are you at a furniture? Oh, I was part of the marketing department. <laughs> 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 But this one, the, the one we just left was uh, Matula Shikor. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, Sundiata Koli. Mm -hmm. We named the different apartments for different political prisons. Mm -hmm. And Matula Shikor, as you know, died shortly after they, they freed him up to die. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then here is Sundiata Koli, who was locked up for something like 50 some odd years. Wow. Former with the Black uh, Panther Party, then the uh, Panther 21. He was one of those 21 people they held for two years uh, on a hundred and some odd charges for conspiracy. And the conspiracy was to blow up the botanic, the flowers in a botanical garden uh, or something to that effect. So they beat all the charges. Well, well, uh, Tupac's mama beat it. She was 19, 20 years old. She was about eight months pregnant and she defended, and I'm sorry, defended them and, uh, uh, and they beat the cases. And so, um, with, uh, Sundiata was with uh, Asada uh, when the government tried to kill her when they stopped them on the highway, uh, New Jersey Turnpike. So, yeah, he was locked up, like I said, something like uh, 50 years before they freed him. Jeremy, she was yeah. pregnant with Tupac? At the time. She was pregnant yeah. with Tupac at the time. Wow. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're going to move upstairs to the women's section. Yeah. 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 Right. So, that's a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
Okay, this is upstairs where the women will be yeah. residing. Um, I call this the green room, but uh, I call it the green room because of the sofa. So we'll go right in. Red room, beautiful dining room that overlooks the basketball court. Yeah. And then we got the dining room overlooks the basketball court. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then <laughs> oh, yeah. and the women up here being protected while they got this balcony out here. <laughs> Each apartment upstairs has a balcony, so they can just walk out and actually. You can see the red, black, and green flag from the Uhura house from their apartments. So, Ellie, you want to talk a little bit about the furniture? You know, <laughs> Uhura, well, I'll just salute Deputy Chair Onis Nayashitela for the vision of this incredible, beautiful building um, for the African Independence Workforce Program. It was such an honor to bring a truckload full, 15 foot truck full of uh, beautiful furniture from a group furniture and collectibles in Philly to, you know, outfit this um, amazing building with all the all the apartments for the African Independence Workforce Program. And um, yeah, these beautiful Enzo pieces that Ruby was talking about, hand painted by an artist, Carter. And in the, and this is a Cuba design from Africa that matches the pillows, of course. And um, those were hand sewn by a, a beautiful seamstress called Bridget Williams in Philadelphia. She did all the all the pillows for her furniture, and all this you know amazing furniture was part of the nonprofit. Yeah. And let me just say that all the sofas that you see came from Facebook Marketplace. So this beautiful green sofa I got it for three hundred dollars, brand new out of the box. I got it with rug for like thirty dollars you know, off of Facebook Marketplace. So, you know, all the money that you donated, we try to utilize the money to the best of our ability. But as you can see, we have really beautiful things in, in each apartment. So you would never know that it was not expensive. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna go on to the next and apartment. This, which this is apartment is named for Desi X Woods. Des so yeah. She is the sister who um um took a ride, her and her friend Cheryl Todd, after they went to visit Todd's brother, who was in Reedsville Prison in Georgia, they, they hitchhiked there to get to the prison. Uh, or they were having to hitchhike back because they were broke. They wouldn't let them get into the prison. So uh, this man named Ronnie Horn offered a ride to them. A uh, white man, he had this, you know, this remote thing in his car, you know, when you can get on and talk to people and, and had a gun up on the dashboard and he told them he was a cop. He was going to give them a ride back to Atlanta. And they got in the car with him, and then he drove into the wooded area and got him on his thing and called his friend to come you know, meet him because they had these women they were going to. And Desi fought him. She fought him and took his gun from him and shot him. She said, Chairman, I shot him and did like this. I thought I missed. Yeah. <laughs> so I shot him again. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move to the next apartment to the right, which is uh, a thought of the poor. Yeah. The international yeah. campaign for three years he wins was what, four years, six years? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. He came to Oakland after she was released. They've got a street name for yeah. her in, uh, in Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. That same Come in. That's it. Oh, 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 that's and I just want to say that we couldn't do have done this project without uh, we 
could not have done this major project without um, the help of our amazing volunteers. A lot of people came in uh, and helped paint it on curtains, uh, put bring up furniture, and just really made it their you know you know commitment to see this project through. So it was very very important. Um, here's another Enzo piece. Do you know who that was designed by? Carter did that one. Carter did that yeah. one as well. I, I love, I wouldn't want to steal it from my house. <laughs> it's really beautiful. And uh, um, the leather sofa I got off of Facebook Marketplace for like $200. It's full of leather. And uh, it came with the chair uh, and the rug. So again, um, this is named after, who is it up there? Is that uh, Asada Shakur? Shakur. This, yeah. this apartment is for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like the slogan that we use because nobody in the world, nobody in history has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral uh, sense of the people who were oppressing them. Yeah. So uh, it's a backyard that, um, that's fenced in and downstairs in the basement, we have washer and dryer. We also have TVs, but we haven't put those up yet for each one of them, and we're going to be soliciting for computers, so there'll be a computer in each apartment complex as well. well so, I'm an ex-prison, I'm ready to move in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we, like you said, nothing, nothing short of the best for the African working class. I mean, I would want to stay in one of these apartments. Yeah. They're yes, really, really yeah. nice. You know, just imagine when you get out of being in prison for so yeah. long and you come to, home to something like this, it yeah. really makes you feel good. Yeah. And it gives you a jump start to, you know, from being in, uh, institutionalized for such a long period of time. So that's what, you know, our goal is to really make it the best for the African working class. And I think we've done a good job of doing that. Yeah. 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 So we're going to make our way downstairs and we're going to head down West Florissant uh, to our little GECO or our little uh, Uber Bakery and Cafe. I love it. Yeah, no, you see me. Oh, here, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah
Um, we're gonna turn right and go, go straight down to where we're gonna be having the women's center, and then after that, we're gonna be going to the small Jico kitchen or Hoor Bakery and Cafe. I keep saying Jico. Oh, Chairman, go get you. Yeah. This is the transformation that we've made. And uh, this incredible uh, uh, woman, artist, leader, uh, owner Zanea Chitella, uh, we was, I was talking to Angelica uh, while we were in one of the other buildings, and she was saying that uh, the deputy chair reminds her of her husband, who was able to see these ragged cars and, wow, <laughs> and see the beauty in it. <laughs> and, see the house. and then deputy chair can see this devastation and can actually envision yeah. transforming it. And that's what we see, even with the murals and everything else. I mean, we could have put the basketball court here without the murals. We could have put the other yeah. stuff, but just taking on the entire thing, just designing, just redesigning this thing so the devastation has disappeared yes. and the life of the people can be anticipated, can be experienced and more can be anticipated. Yeah, yeah. Uhuru. I just want to say really quickly, our, I'm, I'm sure Kitty Riley is on the, on the live right now. And I, she's really was responsible, really uh, spearheading and leading the basketball court here. Um, and she did a ter tremendous job, even fighting with the people, the owners, which they tried to get us for $25,000 more. And we fought them back and we only had to pay them five more. So <laughs> Kitty, Uhuru got <laughs> I'm sure Kitty did yeah. that, but I know Janice was somewhere in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're on the we we stay on this side. Okay. And uh, about the sidewalk. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you, you, okay. <laughs> yeah. So we're so we're trying to get the city to fix the sidewalk. Uh, actually, this is why Kitty uh, fractured her hip because she was getting out of the car and stepped in a uh, bad sidewalk. So we really want them uh, to fix the sidewalks here and at the Uhura House as well. So, oh, I was down there at the warehouse. Oh. Yeah. One of the uh, guy who was an older person uh, now sent somebody to see us when we were uh, working on the horror house to let us know that if we gave the older person some money, uh, <laughs> that we could make stuff happen. <laughs> And we told him we didn't do that kind of stuff. And owner told him that uh, I'm going to see you on. <laughs> she said I'm going to see you on TV, handcuffed, being taken to prison. And he was. He was. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. John Muhammad. Okay. 3901 West Florida, we, we just acquired that also from a tax sale, and we have courted that off as well. We want to put um, another, we want to put a vegetable garden there for the kitchen uh, to grow vegetables and all kinds of fruit on this property right here. So we fenced it off and uh, getting ready to uh, see how we can get resources to make it happen. Well, 
Back then it was like about 10% uh, vacant in between, you know, uh -huh. one year, one day. So, uh, so it was already done. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, pulling it out and to let people work. Like, I don't know if it was an able to Yeah, it's a church. Uh-huh. Why people don't have Okay, so right on this corner was a furniture store. Is it behind you, Lisa? And now uh, one guy has brought this whole block of he's creating commerce in the community. And I know he's very familiar with us. And um, he has a barbershop. He's building a restaurant, a laundromat on this strip here as we go by. Yeah. right here for a minute. Absolutely. This is where we're going to have a whole lot to be across the street. I'm trying to give everybody a chance to come up. Now then, should we cross over? I think we should cross over once we can. Well, the lady that wanted the front part, she ended up buying the bike. We thought we owned the whole thing. Oh, God. 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 Oh,
So she brought brought. So this is oh, the future home of Ahura Watalia. Can everybody hear me in the back? Ahura comrade. So this is the future home of Ahura Watalia, where we're going to have our women's center. So we, for the sake of time, we're going to keep going because we're going to the last stop, the bakery. <laughs> yeah, it's empty. Just got the new sign up. Uhura Baker and Cafe, delicious homemade pies, breakfast and lunch, building an independent African economy. So we just purchased this building, I think the beginning of the year, January. I can't even wow. remember anymore. Uh, <clears throat> and as you can see, it's a big lot. If you come on around, there's a lot of things where we can hold pop up any kind of outdoor activity we can hold. So um, we're going to go inside. We demo part of the building and getting ready for the architectural plans. They're actually hanging in the building so you can see what it's going to look like. So Maureen Wagner is the director. You want to talk to Hello, Deputy Chair, comrades, Chairman Amali Shatella. I just want to salute the Black Power Blueprint, the leadership of Chairman Amali Shatella, the brilliance of Deputy Chair, and to bring Uhuru Foods into this community. They call it a food desert. It's not an accident. It's not an act of nature. It's apartheid. And this project is part of changing that and bringing people into the Black Power Print. Over the course of 40 years, probably almost every person who's here today has participated in one way or another in Uhuru Foods. Uh, thousands and thousands of people, including white people, have participated consciously to bring about economic development in the Black community as an act of reparations, as an act of, uh, of self-determination. And I have um, Vice, um, Vice Chair Bakri on the phone, oh. so I'd like to put him up to the speaker. Mm -hmm. Uhuru Rep Bakri. Bakri is the Western regional representative of the African People's Socialist Party, and he is also the vice chair of Uhuru Foods and Pies. So. And he's moving from California to St. Louis. All right. You heard that, Bakri? <laughs> no. You said you're moving here. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that time. Go ahead, because we don't have that much time. Go ahead, Bakri. Can't hear you. Chairman at DC for the vision and for the relentless work on the ground. I'm excited to be a part of this process. What you're looking at now is Little Chico that's opening later this year 
in St. Louis, and we're going to be building toward the big G called Natural Bridge in Goodfellow. And it's bringing 40 years of uh, building an economic institution that negates the power of the, uh, of the white community, of the uh, capitalist colonialist community. So we really look forward to providing this great food. We have sweet potato pie, blackberry pie. We have lemon scent pie. We have savory pies. We're going to be bringing jerk chicken, vegan jerk chicken. We're going to have breakfast food, um, lunch. And it's just going to bring this all to a food desert, as someone stated earlier. And I'm excited, as the chairman just said, to be moving to North St. So it's, um, it is definitely something that's needed. And it fits right in with the Black Power Blueprint uh, on that corridor that you are walking through right now. Um, it is going to be called an Uhuru Corridor, hopefully. But the thing is, we want to turn uh, this little backward town around. And I think it's so important for Uhuru Foods and Pies to be a part of that and to be making that happen. And I know Deputy Chair said we have, um, uh, I don't have time, so I don't want to be uh, redundant. So, Uhuru. Uh, Uhuru. Yes, and um, Ali's going to show people the prints from the architect Wayne Thompson. So, I mean, it's just it's, it's not a little thing that every time somebody passes here, comes here, they pass something that says building an independent African economy. Mm -hmm. As the political relationship, the political connection is made for the people all the time. So, I just think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are thousands and thousands of people who will see that just passing by, whether they stop or not. We're not just taking the job of the freedom of trying it. This is not our Indian. Yeah, I think not, but I think it's so true. And I mean, there's so many. I think. No, what you said was. Oh, this year. Uhuru, I we'll just really want to salute the Deputy Chair and the Chairman for this vision as part of the Black Town Blueprint, a beautiful, amazing new Uhuru Bakery and Cafe. And this wow. uh, um, Deputy Chair, we've built so many incredibly important relationships with architects, uh, construction people through this whole project. And this is a drawing and a rendering by architect um, Dwayne Thompson, mm -hmm. who is just, I made a beautiful drawing of what this could be. And their plan was, because as you can see, this is a very small space and we have three different things going on in here. We have to bake pies, produce pies. We have to have a kitchen that can bring, you know, produce all the food, the, you know, um, for breakfast and lunch that's gonna be served here. And then, um, what's the third okay. thing? We want Have people to, oh, yeah, we want people to <laughs> <laughs> invite people in. So it's a real community center and political center, you know, um, of the Uhuru movement. So they came up with a brilliant idea, which was to expand it with a container, you know, on the right on the side of the building. So this is, it's going to be, it's going to be built right here, but right, you know, with a little space in between. But so people can be sitting at a, at a counter, you know, where they're sitting and eating and they can watch the production of the pies. They can wow. smell the food, you know, that that's going to be the production area for the pies. And then, um, and here's the design of it. That people can see, so this will be the kitchen, of course, back here. And they're bringing a huge container full of equipment from Oakland, California, you know, so there's going to be new um, kitchen equipment. And then, so then here is the furnace. In this area here, there's going to be a bathroom, wheelchair accessible bathroom right here. And then that's where the counter is going to go, right where you're standing. And um, 
you know, so wow. people will be able to sit in this area. There's also going to be seating outside, you know, in the front nice. and on this side. These windows, of course, will be open so people can see in and out. And it's just going to open up the whole wow. thing. So that's wow. a brilliant design. Yeah. As our architect who is the architect who has designed all of our properties that we've seen so far that went from the ground up, uh, Dwayne Thompson, uh, he's been with us, he's African, and he has, he has also um, students that are training, which are Asian and Chinese, and they are so excited about this project. Yeah. Actually, um, what was his name? Xiao Sheng. Xiao Sheng is the one that actually uh, drew his rendering of the of the, the Hoover Bakery. And we're just very excited because we think that this is going to, like you said, it's going to be the jump off to the bigger uh, bakery that's going to be on Goodfellow and Natural Bridge. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to be amazing. So mm -hmm. we're going to be asking people to come back again, you know, once we start uh, really, uh, you know, start the production of making this whole space what it needs to be. So we're very excited. Yeah, I just think that it's really. Oh, can I? Can ahead, can please, say, yeah. we, I just want to give a shout out to Paul Kessler. Yeah, I, yeah. everybody yeah. knows who Paul yeah. Kessler is. Yeah. And yeah. he's going to be flying in from uh, California. He's going to uh, make the cabinets. Yeah, the, the, counter. Ca the counter, mm -hmm. and he did a he did the whole bakery back. He did the whole bakery, bakery and, yes. and opened. Yes. How many years ago was that? Yeah. Eighty-seven. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, they're extraordinary. They were the most yeah. beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> yeah. beautiful display, art, artisanal. You would have to say. Yeah. I mean, it was so beautiful. Um, and I know that, I mean, he's an amazing artist um, mm -hmm. of that. So that's so exciting. And he's a member of the Peru Summit. Yeah. And we were talking to Evan last night about helping him. Yeah. Oh, oh, right. yeah. 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 Right. So, uh, right. uh, <laughs> so I just think it's important, though, to this is what the government is attacking. Yeah. 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 To be very clear on that. Just attacking this and okay. attacking the relationships that we developed with yeah. the people that bust stuff, this bullshit race thing. Oh. that they have created to uh, obscure the colonial question, right? Mm -hmm. This is what the government is attacking. Mm -hmm. And I just, you should see this and understand that. And you see every time you pass by building an independent African economy, that's mm -hmm. what it says. That's what all of our projects say everywhere around the world. Mm -hmm. This is what they're attacking. Mm -hmm. yes. And we have to be clear on that. And we have yeah. to make everybody yeah. else clear about that as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this relationship, mm -hmm. right? This is the first time in history when they killed Fred Hampton, you didn't hear a peep. Uh, uh, that much from the white community. When they killed Malcolm, not a peep. Martin Luther King was Africans always. Now they have a situation and they can't just attack us. They have yeah. to go into the white community as well because the black revolution has extended itself. Yeah. That means the revolution of all the people has extended itself uh, 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 now. So they have to come to the white community too. And that's something that will mobilize other white people to recognize where their interests really lie. Yes. Yeah. 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 So we see how it look now. So when it's done, you know it's going to be beautiful, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. It'll be fantastic. Yeah. So we want everybody to come back to St. Louis um, in probably the end of July. You know, uh, we know we have the trial on September 3rd. So we are thinking that we won't open until after the trial. So maybe we, have we can take stuff. lies to the court. Right? <laughs> <laughs> maybe the just a new thing with pie. <laughs> so we'll be working on all the things going to the trial. All right. All right. So we'll be working with uh, building the construction out up until the trial. And yeah. we're thinking that we'll open after the trial. So we have a big celebration here yes. in St. Louis as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, victory party. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you again. We are with the end of the tour. We're going to head back. How many minutes, Leah? Uh, 15. So we should be able to make time. it. And we do have cars here for people. We can caravan people back to the Uhura house as well. Thank you, Uhura. Uh -huh. uh -huh. yeah. Right. Yeah. Watch your step. Please watch your step. Yeah. <laughs>
South America. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. It's like a very. The economy is. Like the people, it's the, the companies making, making loads of money off of yeah. Like, yeah, shoot. Yeah. 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 Um, that was a yeah, I think. Uh, it's so
Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like the like, like, you know. Maybe just tell that there's the other Every problem we've got ourselves. I think we should um edit when it is two or something like it and we can like a better thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, well. That's so that they don't have to get the name of a march for reparations. This is here the group of music. I want to jump on it. I have a responsibility to a shark. Oh, of course. Yeah, they had a few of them. I thought they had a few of
I think it's like oh, no, it's, yeah, they, yeah. I almost big it. nail. I, maybe I'll just stand here for a sec. The whole is crap like this. Totally not. Very welcome back, everybody. I know everybody's still coming um, and getting situated, but I did want to let the people know that just joined during the tour because some people did. Please sign in at the table at the front of the room uh, before you come in. And I think it's, that was just so powerful, so incredible. It's, every time I see these projects, I'm, I'm unbelievably inspired. Uh, but if you saw that online, I would encourage you to come and see how powerful these programs are in person. 
So please reach out and we can schedule a time so you can see these projects. And also, if you were inspired by that, like I am, go to uhurusolidarity.org slash pay dash reparations, pay reparations, but keep these projects funded and make sure that these projects can get funded by being part of the movement, by joining, by becoming a member and by paying reparations. It's so impactful to be a part of this movement. Um, I would like to go ahead now and bring up Chair Penny, Chairwoman Penny. I think so. Or no? Should we wait? Okay. Um, this is not, this is, uh, there is a sign up going around for signing up for being at the trial in September. I think that's at the table back there, but please make sure that you see that, that you either go sign up for it or that you find that form. Oh, we're going to do the video? Okay. Yeah. Is this Len's video? Okay. Uhuru, this is Len Demmer, the International Membership Coordinator of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, calling on you to become a card-carrying member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement today during our 2024 spring membership drive with the goal to win 1,000 white people who say no more genocide in our name. And I actually uh, answered the call for membership and joined during the 2020 convention when African people in the U.S. and around the entire world were rising up and resisting after the police murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless other African people. And I wanted to do something beyond protest, uh, and I wanted to get organized under the leadership of the African working class, the African People's Socialist Party, who have been building long-term solutions to end colonialism and genocide since 1972. And today, uh, as the U.S. government and the colonial powers of the world are growing more and more desperate to maintain control, the uprisings of colonized people is escalating more and more, and we are being called on as white people to join the revolution under their leadership. So you can become one of 1,000 white people who say no to FBI war on black liberation, who say, I stand with Chairman Amali Yeshitela and the Uhuru Three and their righteous struggle for anti-colonial free speech, who say Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. And 1,000 white people in anti-colonial solidarity is just the beginning. So become a member today by going to uhurusolidarity.org slash join and say no more genocide in our name. Uhuru. Uhuru, okay. I just want to say again how amazing that tour was. Thank you, Deputy Chair, for yeah, let's applaud that. Okay. And now we'll welcome back Chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee, Penny Hess. Uhuru, thank you, Lauren. And I want to join in saluting Deputy Chair Onizene Shatella for that powerful, powerful tour that we just had. I want to just let's give a round of applause. And to, there is no place like that. But when we see what St. Louis has been historically, it didn't just it's not an accident that North St. Louis was falling down in shambles. That was a conscious policy of the city, as in many cities around the U.S., but that St. Louis is a template for colonial violence, for colonial oppression, yeah. both in terms of the African community and the indigenous community, as we talked about yesterday, where the, uh, the center, the Jefferson Barracks, was 
the, uh, the, the center of the quote, Indian wars, the wars of genocide against the indigenous people for the whole country. One of, one of the leaders of the, gen, of the Jefferson barracks was, uh, his name was Fremont, General Fremont. There is a town named after him in the Bay Area of California because he went to California and murdered indigenous people there and led that. This is what St. Louis represents. They had a program called the Team Four Plan, which took money and kept money from the African community um, here in, in St. Louis. They had a policy towards the African community that was called Let It Rot. Let It Rot, put no resources into it whatsoever so that white people could, uh, so that their businesses could thrive. There was a, a beautiful neighborhood um, in North St. Louis that was called, I'm just forgetting now, uh, called Mill Creek, Mill Creek Valley was the name of the neighborhood in which African people had businesses, had um, schools and, and colleges and barbershops and business. And it was, a, it was an amazing place. And the city tore it down consciously. Also, the whole African neighborhood around what is now the arch, yeah. which is the symbol of genocide, the quote manifest destiny uh, policy of, of genocidal terror and uh, extermination of the indigenous people crossing the Mississippi River, you know, that, that the whole of the, this land belongs to white people. And so that's, that's what is represented here and to see the work of the African People's Socialist Party, Deputy Chair Onesene, wow, that is so beautiful. And when we donate to the Uhura Solidarity Movement, like Deputy Chair said, this is where it goes. It's completely transparent. And this is why the African People's Socialist Party is under attack today. And we have to, we have to build this movement. We have to build this movement. This is the future. This is about when African workers have political and economic power in their hands. That is the society. This is the society that we see right here that is going to be built. And we have, we have a role to play by going into the white community and turning back over the stolen resources that we have because of the Team 4 plan, because of the genocide of the indigenous people and the stolen land. Um, that that we live on as the colonizers, and we have the ability to to join the future of this planet under the leadership of the African Revolution. We're not going to do it. And I wanted to I wanted to also say something about yesterday, and I really appreciate Chair Mwezi's summation of the significance of of this beautiful day that was yesterday, this powerful day. Um, and that um, that there was there. Um, hold on one second. That the thing that I wanted to talk about was the fact that um, the the one of the things that we don't know about the party, or maybe that we don't put it out enough, is that because it articulates the the reality that the African revolution is in unity with all oppressed and colonized peoples of the planet, that in the in the Oakland years, as they call it, in the years when the headquarters of the party was in Oakland, California, which was a very dynamic period in which so much happened there, led by Chairman O'Malley Shatella with the goal to fight this counterinsurgency and keep the African revolution alive, um, that Every every week at the Uhuru House were events and incredible events with, that had relationships, that the party had relationships at that time with members of the Sandinistas from the Nicaraguan Liberation Movement, members of the EZLN, of the, of the El Salvador Liberation Movement. All these had people in the Bay Area of which uh, the African People's Socialist Party was was close to them and 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 brought them in, and Comrade Mona yesterday talked about how her mother. She said, "I don't know if people saw that, but she said her mother had spoken at the Uhuru House 
back in the time. And I was like, yes, I remember. And I just want to say, Mona, I don't know if you're on, but, and I'm, I will email you because I want you to know, I remember your mother. Yes, I do. Because she spoke at the Uhuru house or at an event that, that we had um, that was, you know, sponsored by maybe the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. I don't remember all the exact details, but I do remember her saying that she grew up in Nasser's Egypt. And she said, under Nasser, Egypt was Africa, not the Middle East. Yeah. And that that African that you know that Africans from Egypt were proud of that. And I I just, you know, I just want to say that because I that is emblazoned, that presentation was so powerful of your mother's Mona. And that's why I mean, and you're here. I mean, this is this is so powerful. This yeah. this is the historic nature. And you know, a few years ago, just to say really quickly, I was in the Bay Area. We were doing some organizing out there. You know, I was staying with Comrade Maureen, and you know, there were different events going on. And when you know, I'm any place like like the chairman, I always go to the Y. And when I was at the Y, I met this couple who I was talking to them, a husband and wife, probably about my age, and they were saying that, that they were from Argentina and they were part of the resistance against the death squads. And, um, and, and it was right when the Pope, you know, they just got this new Pope and they were saying that Pope was part of the death squads, you know, and we were talking about that. And then I'm telling them, you know, what I did in the Uhuru movement. And they were like, we spoke at the Uhuru movement, at the Uhuru house. We spoke at the Uhuru house, they said, in the 1980s. It was like the Garvey movement, that it just attracted. You know, we saw the pictures of the chairman with Iranian students and the whole relationship with the students from Iran. The chairman's always saying, you need to struggle for this, you need to struggle for that. And I want to salute you know, just the chairman's leadership, the internationalism of it in practice. I have been with the chairman in many situations when people, I remember a woman born in Vietnam came running up to the chairman after he spoke saying, we need you in Vietnam. We need you in Vietnam. You know, that people have said that about many places in the world. They see the chairman as their leadership and indeed he is, because he is the one with the vision of what it means when African workers have power, this beautiful wor world that we can be part of. So I just wanted to, to say those things. This is so historic and important, but as the chairman said yesterday, this has been a long, long, long struggle. The chairman has gone up against the headwinds, um, counterinsurgency and everything that involves, and we face that today. But the chairman has fought, and we are winning. So, Uhuru, chairman. Uhuru, Le uh, Leah, where are you? You're the, still the one controlling the clock. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that uh, that's really important because you know that uh, many people wrote off the 70s as being having historical significance in terms of revolutionary movement in this country, but we were here and uh, we led it. Uh, I mean, everything, Desi Woods, we, you went through the Desi Woods place, uh, Suniata, uh, uh, and then incredible work that we uh, continued with the revolutionary project uh, that was happening globally. We were, people came to the Uhuru movement because we were the living representation of the anti-colonial struggle after it was supposed to be dead. And so Argentina, uh, uh, and you know, we had this relationship, Chile, uh, a deep relationship with comrades uh, after uh, 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 Pinochet had, uh, with uh, Kissinger and others had murdered uh, I don't know how many people uh, 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 in Chile, and, and not just Chile, because revolutionaries from all over South America went into Chile uh, after Allende was elected. Uh, uh, the socialists get elected, so they assume uh, that now socialism is possible, it's happening, et cetera, and they go there. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, a criticism that was being made and made before it happened uh, with uh, Allende 
is that the people had to be armed, uh, mm -hmm. that they could not relate, rely on the gut in the same state uh, that was controlled by uh, by by Pinochet and the United States government. Uh, they had to be armed. The people had to be armed. Uh, but we had this relationship with these folk. But after the revolution was killed, uh, they were they were at the Uhura House. They were in this relationship with us. And the point is that. We, we did maintain this relationship, and that's just part of it in terms of the things. I, I wanted to say that, and also, nothing that we have experienced uh, right now, that we are experiencing at this moment, that we are experiencing with this convention uh, would be possible if we were slaves to this, this bogus, uh, uh, fallacious struggle against racism. And there are many reasons why that's a problem. Not only because it, it centers the whole world on white people, that somehow uh, everything, you know, this is the, the sun with, within which uh, everything revolves, you know. Uh, but the thing also is it traps white people. Um, it makes it difficult for people uh, to move uh, toward revolutionary conclusions uh, because in order to do so, they have to go against their whiteness. You can't help being white. You understand, as it's characterized, you know, you know, this whole artificial definition of whiteness. So it's almost like being self-denial, self, -denial, self uh, in order to to unite with the struggle of African liberation and other peoples around the world. We don't want you to self-deny. We want you to recognize your connection to the rest of the goddamn world uh, as just part of it and, and a minority part at that, not just part, a minority part at that. So the thing is that we open up the door uh, for this to be possible. This is a magnificent movement. This this thing that we have done, that you come into, and we only had one new member, and we're going for nine more today. And so you might as well come on board because this is the right train to be on right now, you understand? Because it's a magnificent movement, and it's destroying all of those barriers that stand between uh, 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 white people, uh, between your humanity, this artificial racial concept that was created through the process of colonialism was no such thing as race before then. It's a construct that serves political objectives of a horrible, brutal, vicious uh, colonial ruling class. And this is an opportunity to break free from that under the, the, with the spear uh, uh, being wielded by African internationalism and the Black Liberation Movement. Oh, hold on. Yeah. And by the way, the Vietnamese, and Malcolm X, I heard say it first, and uh, Joshua knows what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, I saw a, a, a video uh, done by Americans that were talking to Vietnamese after the Vietnamese Revolution. And uh, this Vietnamese veteran that uh, was saying that how the Americans were powerful from a distance. <laughs> they, they had bombs, they had all this other stuff making from a distance. He said, but uh, he said, but they are slow and they're clumsy. In order to defeat the Americans, you gotta grab them by the belt. <laughs> you understand? And uh, and this is what Malcolm X was talking about. The white man cannot win another war on the ground. That's why drones and all this other stuff, why? There are a number of reasons for that, but one, because the white man who's fighting other people have no basis for doing it except some material gain. They have no interest of, of their own that can justify doing it except what they're gonna get out of it. It's almost like they transform them into like mercenaries, national mercenaries to go out and do this stuff. I think it was Smetley Butler, is that the guy's name? Who said that, and this is what Josh made the point yesterday about uh, thanking me for my service, you know, uh, that, uh, what did you say, unless you wanted a major corporation, Wall Street Bank, because I wasn't serving you when I was in the military, right? That's what Smedley Butler was saying, et cetera. So uh, I just think that uh, uh, this is something that we should understand. We have to stop being servants of an imperial power, a servants of colonialism, join uh, with that force that can bring it down. And that's the liberation of all of us. And when we say we fighting for black power, 
The fact of the matter is, it's white power that oppresses white women. It's white power that oppresses white homosexuals. It's white power that exploits the workers of the world, et cetera. So it's black power that's consistently being fighting against white power. So that's why you fight for black power, because you want to destroy white power because it's exploitive and oppressive, and it came into existence as a part of the process of oppressing the rest of us, right? So this is a magnificent. How many members did we just get? <laughs> All right, comrades, Uhuru. So, Leah, Laura. Uhuru, thank you so much, Chairman. Uh, we're actually going to hear now a quick word from Jesse about joining USM. Uhuru, that's it. Uhuru. Yeah. That was the best membership pitch you could possibly have just now from Chairman Amalia Chatella. So I just want to echo the chairman's question. First, before I do that, I want to say that it was mentioned earlier that we have an 11th member that joined today. We won 10 yesterday. And I just want to say that was John McCarthy who became a member of the Great Solidarity Movement. Just really want to salute John, just incredible comrade from Center for Political Innovation and now hard carrying member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement who's been out on the front lines for a long time fighting for the Uhuru Three, fighting for anti-colonial free You're speech. So far unindicted. So far unindicted, co-conspirator. Co yes, Uhuru, Uhuru. So we just want to open it up and see who is ready to be like John and be like the 10 comrades who joined the Uhuru Solidarity Movement yesterday and today become a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Is there anybody in the room or online that is ready to do that today. Most of you in here are already member. Oh, Deputy Chair. So is this a renewal? You can, Deputy Chair is definitely a member. I'm looking at my membership coordinator back there. Yeah. Yeah, Deputy Chair. Thanks for it. Come in. We got Josh Curley. Veteran for peace, right on. All right, and we're going to keep this going all throughout the day. Our goal for this weekend is 20 new members. And later on in, in the program, we're going to have a whole workshop presented by our membership office on the work of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, what you are actually joining and, and can be a part of when you become a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Um, and we also have a workshop closing out the convention on the March Against Genocide campaign that we will be launching this year. So, um, but... Before I get out of your way and we go into our next panel, which is going to be really powerful, uh, I just want to also salute and thank Deputy Chair for that incredible tour of the Black Power Blueprint. And I want to salute and congratulate all of you who have attended this convention online and in person who collectively raised $20,440 for the work of the African People's Socialist Party. And if you were not here yesterday and didn't get an opportunity to contribute, we just want to let you know that you can go to uhurusolidarity.org slash pay dash reparations and contribute reparations towards this anti-colonial work, towards this anti-colonial strategy, towards Black power. And if you did contribute yesterday and you were inspired to contribute even more, you can also do that by going to uhurusolidarity.org slash pay dash reparations or coming to talk to us at our table in the back and filling out a pledge card, writing a check, uh, or otherwise making, making your contribution. So we wanna keep the reparations coming all weekend long with this national convention and uh, continue to join the Uhuru Solidarity Movement and pay reparations to the Black Power Blueprint. So I will turn it back over to our amazing MC and shout out to our incredible MC, Comrade Lauren. Uhuru. Okay, Uhuru, thanks so much. <laughs> Wonderful. So yeah, we have um, an unbelievable panel coming up here, actually. Let me get to the page for that. Okay. Um, so this panel is Put Colonialism on Trial, 
from Gaza to South Africa to North St. Louis, no more genocide in our name. And Chairwoman Penny of the African People's Solidarity Committee will be moderating. So please welcome as well, APSP Director of Communications and Media, Akile Anai, a Fianuan Gaza, a veteran of the Student Nonviolent Coordinate Coordinating Committee and Executive Director of the Malcolm X Center for Self-Determination, Tafari Mugheri, Director of the African Region of the APSP, and Chairman of the APSP, Amalia Shatela. <laughs> Oh, we'll come back. All right, so are we the only two persons who are here that's going to be on this task? Um, there's three remote persons. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's where where are those speakers Okay. Excuse me, I do have a few German. I'm sorry. I do have a few Biden moments, so please bear with me. Good. <laughs> if we stay, if we stay. <laughs> you never said that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. All right. But I do remember his son, the date of his son's death. <laughs> that cannot be charged, yeah. That's right. Missed funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uhuru, Uhuru. Um, it's very, it's really an honor to be here today. And I want to again salute Chairman Omali Shatella, Deputy Chair Onisene Shatella. And I want to say that, that they are why and how I understand and we understand the world beyond our, our little our little world sitting on the pedestal of the oppression of everybody else on the planet, which lets us see ourselves as what the chairman has called the subject of subjects of history. We make ourselves the subjects of history and everybody else, as the chairman said, are the objects of history. We have talked a lot about the question of genocide in this conference, but also in the world right now, because the question of genocide is happening before our very eyes against by the US backed Israeli settler state against the Palestinian people who are rising up for their own liberation. And I am I am, am on, let me introduce who's on, are people on? Yes, I just wanted to say who will be part of this, um, this very important um, panel, and then I would give a brief overview, but I wanted to say this includes Akila Anai, the uh, Director of Media and Communications for the African People's Socialist Party, just a very, very dynamic leader of the, young leader of the party, um, she was featured in Ebony Magazine during her 2017 bid for city council in St. Petersburg, Florida, where she ran on a platform of unity through reparations, something that, uh, contrary to what the state says, has nothing to do with Russians. And uh, <laughs> welcome, welcome, Director Akile. Also, we have on Afia Nguanza, 
who is a veteran of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and Executive Director of the Malcolm X Center for Self-Determination, um, I believe in North Carolina. Um, welcome. South, South welcome. Carolina. South Carolina. We're having trouble hearing you. Um, oh, wow. There's, uh, there's some, uh, I don't know if it's on our end or your end. Can you hear me now? There's something that's distorting distorting your voice, and we are not able to hear it correctly. Let me just let me introduce the other people, and then we'll come back to that. Uh, we also want to welcome Fafari McGarry, chairman of the African People's Socialist Party in Occupy the Zania, South Africa. McGarry was born and raised in Occupy the Zania and works throughout the townships, which is basically a euphemism for the conditions that the African working class is forced to live in in South Africa today um, and bringing health education and organization and the party to African people. Uh, and of course, Chairman Omalia Shatella, the founder and leader of the Uhuru movement, the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party and worldwide revolutionary leader fighting for the liberation of African people and for all oppressed and colonized peoples. So um, are we still working on that? Okay, Uhuru, Uhuru everybody. An Uhuru. honor to have you here. This is, this makes it kind of hard because I have, we have to turn around to see you. Um, and I just wanted to, to say a few words before we go into this that and I'm speaking as the chair and a member of the African People's Solidarity Committee, the organization of white people formed under the leadership of the party as a strategic organization to, to be the voice of black power inside the belly of the beast to, to bring this as white people. And that the chairman has raised, has always raised in many, many years, He's raised the point that white people only created the word genocide when white people killed other white people in Europe. And before that, it was the norm to everybody else as the norm, the word that Aaron Bushnell used, the, the government wants this to be the norm. Yes, it is the norm and it has been the norm for a long time, for centuries. Genocide means deliberately murdering a whole ethnic group or, or other group. And just as, and I think that one of the ways they say it is that as murder is to a single person, genocide is to a whole nation of people. It is when uh, massive- Homicide, yeah, versus- Or homicide yeah, yeah. versus genocide. Yes, Chairman, thank you for that. And that, um, that, but the, but the reality is that the centuries of slaughtering African and indigenous people were the norm. And it is not talked about and it wasn't even counted under the word genocide. It was what you do. It was, again, you know, in Aaron Bushnell's words, it was what this government wants to be the norm. It is yeah. the norm. And that genocide is, is part and parcel of colonialism. Genocide is part of colonialism and it is a function of what the chairman calls the colonial mode of production. If you look at, at what are the slogans of the colonizers? They are exterminate all the brutes. They are kill everything that moves. That was a slogan of the U.S. Army to the, when, when the people of Vietnam were fighting for their freedom. It was clearing the land, kill the buffalo, kill the ability of the people to eat, to their environment which, in which they lived. And there's also the colonial statements that you hear. Well, they weren't doing anything with the land. Hmm. We planted the trees. We did this and we did that. And that, you know, and again, everything that happens that, that the US backed 
settler colonial government of Israel is doing to the Palestinian people. It did here. And that they say Hitler used what the U.S. did to the indigenous people. He was, yeah. it was like, okay, this is, this yeah. is what I want to do. And that this, this is um, the, the mode, you know, this is the template that is there for how this genocide is being carried out against the people of Palestine right now, based on what the U.S. did to the indigenous people and to African people. And I remember, you know, one time years ago when we were at, I think the Alameda County, this again was in the Oakland years, we were at the Alameda County Commission and we were struggling against, uh, I think the fact that the city, let me just say in Oakland, in California, if you haven't been there, I mean, there, I bet you there's 50, thousand homeless people in that city back then there were 30,000 people this is in the 80s homeless mostly Africans they didn't give out tents then they didn't give out tents they there there was nothing and one of the th things that that the city or the county of Alameda was planning to do was to take the homeless people Africans who were living on the streets, forced to live on the streets in Oakland, way out in the county to a military base that had been used for nuclear testing and which was radioactive. And so the chairman and the party called on the anti-nuke environmental movement to support this demand that they not be taken to this radioactive thing. And, and they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it because it was the white left. They would not support the demand of the Uhuru movement and the African working class to do that. And we were we we took this case to the Alameda Alameda County uh, Commission, and I remember there was a woman, a, a commissioner, and she was like, "Shame on you for calling anything but what happened to the Jews as genocide." And so it was, this was a struggle. It was a struggle that African people made that this has to be raised. And, um, you know, I just, I just want to say a few things about that because colonialism is the total domination of a whole people by a foreign and alien state power and people for profit. And genocide is the essence of the colonial mode of production. So, in, in 1948, three years after the end of the Second Imperialist War and after the German attack and extermination of Jews in Europe, the United Nations adopted the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide that stated that in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed to uh, with intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, killing members of the group, be causing seriously serious bodily or mental harm, harm to the members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group, all of which were happening before our eyes in Oakland and in, in the African community. And that African people had to fight for and make a struggle that genocide was happening and is to them. Um, and that, you know, again, that the chairman was talking about how white people killed white people in Europe. Um, and yet, you know, just to say, by the way, that the U.S. government did turn away many ships of Jews that came here. Yeah. They didn't have alliance to that, you know, um, either. And, and that's where we are when we put our, you know, eggs in the basket of a colonial system. Um, when King Leopold of Belgium slaughtered 10 to 20 million African people in the Congo in the 1880s, where there were immense and still are immense resources of rubber, gold, oil, today, coltan, 
everything of the minerals needed for your computers and cell phone, 87% of it is in Congo. There was no term for genocide. And, you know, that was in, in the 1880s and early 1900s. But since the year 2000, at least 10 million, this is something Secretary General Luwezi Kinshasa of the African People's Socialist Party talks about. Now, in the past 10 or 20 years, at least 10 million and probably more Africans have been killed, slaughtered in Congo now in the struggle around coltan, uranium, and all the wealth that is there that the Africans don't control, that the U.S. government murdered, assassinated Patrice Lumumba when he stood up and said the resources of Congo are going to go to the Africans. And he was kidnapped, tortured, his body was chopped up, put in vats of acid to try to wipe him off the face of the earth when he said these resources, these diamonds, this uranium, this is going to go to the people. He was, he was wiped out in the U.S. And the Kennedy administration in particular played a huge role in that. Um, so this question of genocide is not talked about in that way. Um, that, that um, you know, in 1904, in, in what is now called Namibia, which is in the Southwest, right next to South Africa, it's called, it was called Southwest Africa, the Herero and Nama people, and this was a German colony, I would say, um, the Germans had a campaign to wipe out the Herrera and, and Nama people, and they rounded them up in the Kalahari Desert and left them in the burning sun, you know, forced them to, to be there. They couldn't, they couldn't leave without water, without food, until they died from the sun exposure in the most brutal, vicious way. Uh, this was the Germans, and um, this is in 1904, before, you know, before there was Hitler, before Hitler was in power, let's say, and that there was no outcry from the uh, Germans and from, and from Jews. But this was not called genocide. And today, the Herero and Nama of Namibia are still petitioning Germany that paid millions, if not billions, of reparations to Israel to to pay reparations to them and the and this is as recently as last year uh the Herrero and Nama have gone before uh the German parliament or whatever and they have refused to give them a cent because it's not called genocide it was the norm in Kenya the uprising of the Kikuyu people and the leadership of Daidan Kimati um it's estimated that Britain, that Britain uh, murdered more than a hundred thousand Kenyans when they were fighting for the liberation from this brutal, brutal uh, British colonialism imposed upon them. Um, they were called the Mau Mau. They were, you know, they, they were slandered and and they were rounded up and put in bar barbed wire open uh, open camps that they were forced by, at gunpoint to to stay there. Um, this is the wonderful British colonialism that supposedly brought you know civilization to the world and nobody talks about the conditions of genocide inside the US, the conditions of African people in 1951, Paul Robeson and William Patterson submitted a petition to the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, titled We Charge Genocide. And it's a book and you can you can get it. You should get it. Um, and it's called We Charge Genocide, the Crime of Government Against the Negro People. The petition was signed by almost 100 US intellectuals and activists, including, um, in, including W.B. Du Bois and others, who, by the way, and Robeson couldn't go to Geneva to present it because like the chairman, his passport was taken away as a foreign agent. Um, so under attack, and so was W.E. Du Bois as well. Um, so 
Robeson wasn't able to actually present the documents and he was basically charged with being a Russian agent. And like the chairman, he was 82 years old. So um, in 1979- Somebody it, else was 82? No, actually, I'm sorry. You know what? It was W. Du Bois was 82. Okay. I thought, I thought they had retired that number. Yeah. <laughs> no, they started with that number. I'm sorry. It was w. Du Bois was 82. Um, so in 1979, and we'll talk about this more, but the African People's Solidarity Committee held the first walk against genocide. And I, I'll be really quick as I, you know, but I want to I want to say this because in 1982, Chairman O'Malley Chantella coordinated one of the most dynamic and powerful institutions, which was the International Tribunal on Reparations of African People with, you know, there's a book called The Verdict is In and please buy it. It's amazing. And, and it had testimonies from every aspect of life, from the people to to African sociologists and, and historians and et cetera, testi testifying about the conditions of genocide that African people face on every aspect of life in this country. And so it was in this period that APSC began to hold walks against genocide and marches against genocide that we had going from Oakland to Berkeley for many years and still have that. Um, and in other parts of the country as well. And APSC, about this question of reparations, APSC had a serious struggle within our ranks uh, about the question of reparations. And there were there were people you know within our our organization who didn't agree that we owe reparations to African people. And so, you know, there is a few people that left APSC at that point, and that, uh, we came out of that really strong with this understanding that we and all white people owe repara reparations to African people. Um, so that, you know, we had our slogans, no more genocide in our name, all white people owe reparations. And we continue to have the walks against genocides every year. And we'll talk about that more. But during this period in the Oakland years, Chairman O'Malley Chatella was deepening his political theory of African internationalism and developing the colonial question and talking about the opportunism of white people and how white people are governed by our stomachs and pocketbooks. Um, but the leadership of the African revolution is in the interest of white people and that we had to win that. Um, and you know, the, the genocide recorded by Paul Robeson in his book was in the form of the lynchings in particular that we was talking about. Um, and I, I did have the opportunity recently in the last few years to visit the lynching museum in and memorial that is in, Mo, um, I think it's in not Mobile in Montgomery, Alabama. If you ever, if you ever have a chance to go there, you have to see it because it is so moving. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's really profound. And there's no, it's not, a, you know, anyway, they do it in a way that evokes it, but they don't show it. It's just very amazing. But one of the things that I, I wanted to, that I needed to do as part of being an APSC over the years is to investigate what is the role that white people said. Because we, we say that, you know, no more genocide in our name, meaning the government. But the thing that, that I found out in studying and in writing the book, Overturning the Culture of Violence, is that the majority of genocide was carried out by white people, not by the government. So it's not really no more genocide in our name. It's no more genocide that we do in the government's name. And that this is the thing. And I think that if I think about and maybe you know project on Aaron Bushnell, when you come to terms with the fact that U.S. carries out genocide, it's popular, it's supported. We did it. We did it because they need, it takes a lot to, to slaughter, you know, a millions of people. You, it requires the whole society, the superstructure of it being built around it in that way. And, you know, there was, there was the Sand Creek Massacre where, the, the, the government came to, they, they came to uh, Denver 
where this brutal massacre where, where you know, the white volunteer cavalry um, mutilated women and used their body parts as saddle horns and trophies. And the government came, the US government came to investigate because they were you know, going to deal with this. And they had a big meeting of the whole town. This is in the 1800s in the opera house of Denver. And it, they said from the, re, you know, from the historical uh, reports of that, that they, they said, the guy said from the government, he said, well, what should we do with the native people? And the whole, all the white settlers in unison screamed at the top of their lungs, exterminate them, exterminate them. And so this was this this was the popular thing. The lynchings were carried out not by the government, not by the government, by regular by, by our grandparents, by my, our neighbors. It was just regular white people. There was they weren't like weird. <laughs> they were the, the norm. They were the norm. I know I know my time is up, and I appreciate that. So I am going to end there. But I I think that the thing for me is we are part of it and we owe reparations. And we can't just say that it's over now because it's not over now. All the conditions of colonialism are the same. The wealth gap that somebody said of $240,000 for white assets versus Africans, which in the city of Boston have the assets of $8 for African people, like all of this, the healthcare, the children, the 15 kindergarten classes of African children who, uh, you know, die in the first year of life. This is colonialism. We look at it. Yeah. And one thing that the chairman likes, um, George Orwell, one thing that George Orwell said is that you have to work hard to see what's right in front of your nose. And colonialism <laughs> is right here. Uh, uh, and we have to we have to take responsibility for that. And that when we do that, and when we are under the leadership of the African Revolution, that is our redemption. That is our liberation. That is how we get to the future of a planet that you know, the environment, everything that people talked about, no oppression of any sort. So I just want to say that, that we are on the forward side of history. We have to take this message out. We have to win millions of white people to be on this forward side of history or go down in the trash can of history. Because, you know, there is the uprising that is coming. There is the revolution. It is coming because there are, are millions of African people, indigenous people fighting to survive this genocide that's been imposed on it. So I will stop there. And I, I am confident that we are winning and um, we are on the winning side. And that is a powerful, powerful stand to take. Uhuru. 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 So, I want to introduce, it says here, APSP Communications and Media, Akila Anai. Yes, yeah, Uhuru, just, it's powerful to have you here today, Director Akila. It's very much of an honor. Uhuru, Chairwoman Penny, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Uhuru, Uhuru, Chairman, um, and Uhuru. Okay. Guru, guru comrades, um, Uhuru, and it's so, so great to be able to speak again um, at the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, this very profound, historic convention, um, and I uh, really want to appreciate the overview that uh, Chairwoman Penny just gave, because when we talk about put the state on trial, this is part of what we're talking about and pulling out all of this, you know, in terms of exposing, you know, what it is um, that the system has done, what it's responsible for, and why um, a party like the African People's Socialist Party was at, was absolutely necessary to create, to uh, complete the struggle to overturn uh, that type of uh, social system. 
Um, and, and so I'll, you know, talk about that a little bit more, but I just appreciate that overview. And um, again, I have to salute my leadership, Chairman Amalia Shatella, and also want to uh, salute Deputy Chair Onan Zanea Shatella and, um, and want to unite with the chairman uh, when he was just talking about, you know, this is the reason why they are attacking us. Um, because, you know, you have the verdict of colonialism, which, um, you know, determined that African people, like has been said, this is the norm of our, these humiliating conditions of poverty and oppression is supposed to be the norm. And here you have the African People's Socialist Party that's disrupting what is the status quo by putting power in the hands of African people and establishing this independent African economy. And, you know, where as the deputy chair says, you know, uh, having Africans envision the best, nothing less than the best for the African working class. And, you know, you could just see that just through the work that's happened in St. Louis. And of course, that's not the extent of the party's, you know, work in its history, but it's just profound in terms of the, the short period of time that we've been there in St. Louis and to see what has been transformed, you know, with this dynamic leadership of the deputy chair and the African working class. And it is absolutely the reason why the colonial state is after us um, because we've done the impossible and uh, we have determined not to surrender to the verdict of colonialism, but to overturn it. Um, so I just, uh, again, really wanna salute my leadership um, <clears throat> and also salute the chairman because uh, with this attack on our movement on July 29th of 2022, um, it, you know, he came out of the gate recognizing and summing it up that this is a political assault that's being made on our movement using the law and that um, there's nothing uh, even, you know, by their own standards, by their own law that we've done, uh, that we've uh, violated. Uh, there is, you know, the charges are bogus. We haven't committed a single crime, quote unquote, that they characterize, but they use this law to carry out a political assault against our movement uh, without calling it what it is, without saying we are trying to destroy the African liberation movement, that we are determined to keep African people oppressed and colonized. They can't say that. So they have to say, you know, something else like, you know, these are Russian agents that we don't actually believe uh, that genocide is being committed against us. And we don't know that genocide is being committed against us and that we have a responsibility to overturn it. No, it's, you know, um, uh, somebody else uh, and, uh, with a proximity to whiteness that has to tell us, inform us that this is our reality. So um, this is, you know, the 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 fact that we organized a counteroffensive, a mass, you know, campaign through the hands off Uhuru work being led by SG and Wazy and the hands off Uhuru fight back coalition. This is taking it on. This is putting the state on trial. And uh, that was really important. I mean, even you no, know, the chairman winning the lawyers, this dynamic legal team that we have to understanding how we have to take this on because it's not based off any any law. And you'll see they are willing to change the law in this process of making the assault on us. So they're changing what freedom of speech means by calling it action and all these other things. They're right in front of our faces, willing to change their own law in order to uh, justify and you know and put the chairman and the Uhuru three in prison. So you know we we see that we have to take this on in a totally different way and it has to be a po a political struggle that wins masses of people to understanding the true basis the true nature of this assault on our movement um and and you know being prepared to fight it in the streets and so that's what the chairman and the party have been preparing us to do for over our 50 years of existence we know what to do because we have the history um, of this. And that's also part of what we've exposed is that this assault on our movement in 2022 isn't anything new. And that's what we're drawing. We're drawing this out. You have a whole, I mean, Chairman Penny just mentioned, you know, um, you know, the 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 vile and just horrible uh, atrocities committed against Africans who were fighting to be free, who were, you know, um, in leading in the struggle. You had comrades like Patrice Lumumba and you have Kwame Nkrumah and inside the U.S. where the FBI gets to start with the destruction of the Marcus, the the, the movement of Marcus Garvey. And so you have this entire history that shows that the, the U.S. government, the colonial powers have always, always, always worked to thwart the efforts of African and colonized people to be free. And so we pull in all of that context. You, we say you can't isolate this attack on us on the on July 29th of 2022 from the whole history of the state's assault on African people's will to be free. So that's uh, also what we've been able to expose. And, you know, through this process, um, you know, the chairman said that uh, they dropped they, they dropped this rock 
on their foot. I mean, they bust this thing wide open because the chairman and the party have been hitting this question of colonialism for our 50 years of existence. We've been fighting to put this out there, put this out there. And now colonialism, just like reparations, just like we were able to make it a household word, colonialism is becoming a household word. And increasingly the understanding of colonialism as a mode of production. And you know what they have done with this assault in our movement has allowed us to continue deepening this to show the evidence. And um, we talked about how um, you know uh, uh, we're able to show this history of Africans being assaulted for fighting for freedom. We, uh, you know, one of the first things we did was to begin publishing a series of Africans targeted by the FBI. You know, to to show this whole history of this reality that we're being confronted with. And um, you know, so I think, and again, we were just we're able to continue exposing the whole colonial question. I mean, even the whole question of freedom of speech how you know this whole concept of freedom of speech arose for the colonizer was able to achieve freedom of speech and democracy you know on the one hand from fighting against the tyrants in Europe and they were able to achieve this at the expense of stealing and robbing African indigenous people of power over our own lives and achieve their freedom of speech. So here's this thing that they've bestowed upon themselves um, at, at the same time that they take it they take it away and rob Africans and indigenous people of power. Um, on the one hand, here's something that they say they believe in. And, you know, we and so we're, you know, uh, challenging this. Well, how can you believe in this whole concept of freedom of speech when you are attacking you know, um, uh, you know, the Uhuru three, when you are attacking people, you know, for just being able to say, hey, this is what's happening. Genocide is being committed against African people. You know, so I mean, even you uh, able to take the colonial question and able to just bust this whole thing with, with regard to the Constitution, the First Amendment wide open. I mean, something that's never been done before. I mean, you know, it's unprecedented, the assault they're making on us and the charges, but also what they're seeing with this pushback is unprecedented in the way in which we're able to open it up and expose them. And, um, you know, we're not just putting them on trial because of what they did and are attempting to do. Uh, to the Uhuru Three. And like the chairman said on yesterday, that this movement wasn't built to keep any individual person out of prison. It was to complete our revolution, which requires us to win the understanding that colonialism is the fundamental contradiction. And that's what we've been able to do, you know, through uh, this work and with the with this political strategy, this ground game. And, and that's what putting them on trial means. And, um, and and it's forcing them to have to deal with this question, the conditions of African people inside this country, the genocide, the slavery that we've been talking about, the domination and the theft of Africa and African resources, every single crime, every single lynching that no one has ever paid a price for, as it was mentioned, a national pastime inside this country. No one has ever stood on trial or paid the price. Africans have been lynched. Africans have paid the price for, of, uh, of uh, you know, violating some kind of law or something, you know, quote unquote, th with lynchings, right? But, but no one has ever paid a price for the lynchings of African people. Every single assassination, no one has ever paid a price. And we are exposing how the colonizer even got to a place of establishing courts and establishing a state apparatus that allows them to determine the fate of any slave, let alone a slave determined to be free. We are exposing the whole question. How do you even put, you know, in a position to be able to make, you know, make this determination? You are the ones who, you know, forced Africans into captivity, force us to build this entire world social system at gunpoint. You are the one who has stolen indigenous land and then, you know, called it something else and forgot where you came from. Building a wall and, you know, saying that indigenous people can't come up. You know, we are just drawing all of this out, you know, through this process. And again, that's what, it, this is what it means to put the state on trial. This is the thing that they have to answer to. So they not only have to answer to, do you actually believe in what you say you believe in, which is free speech, but, you know, um, is, is, is this is the history that you have to, you know, uh, that has to be reconciled, that has to be dealt with. And um, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here, but the chairman said something at the very beginning of this attack, when we were first attacked and, you know, we were learning all the, the details and this and this first indictment came out against this, um, you know, this this uh, Russian person who, as has been mentioned, um, you know, wasn't even born, wasn't even thought of, you know, when the chairman was, you know, engaged in the struggle of the Black Revolution of the 1960s. But he said that they would make the question whether or not Russians told us to say genocide was happening 
is happening against African people and not whether or not genocide is being committed. This is the question that they want, you know, that they're, the Russians told you to say it, not whether or not genocide is being committed. That's the question that we're forcing them to have to deal with. That's what our trial will do and will prove that genocide is being committed against African people, that genocide is being carried out all around the world by the U.S. government, by the colonial powers, because that's where it gets its start. And that's why we're saying we're putting the state on trial and that this trial has started a long time ago. And um, as Chairman Penny mentioned, in 1982, the party put the state on trial and the verdict was reparations are owed to African people. And um, the missing thing then was that we didn't have state power to carry out that verdict. And this is what we're exposing, that African people don't have power. So anything can happen and can be done to us. And not only do we not have a right to say anything about it, but we've been robbed of power so that our offenders cannot pay a price. But we're turning that history around and putting power in the hands of African people while putting the state on trial and ensuring that the charges are dropped on the Uhuru Three and that this struggle can be completed to a successful conclusion. You know, we are, we will win, we are winning. And uh, this time the African revolution will win. So Uhuru comrades. Uh, we can't hear in St. Louis. Okay, now, go ahead. Uhuru, Uhuru, now I can't hear you, but thank you. That was powerful, powerful. And I unite, that was a brilliant exposition of the party stands and putting the state on trial. Uhuru. Um, I want to bring up, it is my honor to bring up, can people hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you now. So it is an honor to have Afia Nguanza, a, who was a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee veteran and Executive Director of the Malcolm X Center for Self-Determination. Thank you so much for coming on. An honor to have you here. Thank you. It's my honor uh, and privilege to, to join with you. Um, joining first, uh, are you getting an echo? Are you all getting an echo? Can you can, can you hear me? Yes, there is an echo. Can it, can you all hear me? Can hear you. I think I think they can hear you. It's just okay. that a problem hall is muted, but there is a slight echo, Sister Afia. It's still being distorted. It's just. I mean, I can hear you, but we can just hear a slight echo. I know you're on two devices, so is the the other device muted? Yes, one is muted, and the other is on. It, um, um, I mean, is the volume turned down on the other device? It's actually off. I, what I'm trying to do is to use my phone for the sound um, and working. turn off the the um, Go ahead. sound on the computer. It's working. Isn't it? I think Let's we go. can. I think yes. I think we can go ahead. Not, can she hear us? Yeah. I think go ahead, um, Comrade Afia. Okay. Um, first of all, it is a tremendous honor uh, to be participating uh, in this conference generally and especially on this panel. Um, I salute my fellow veteran. Chairman uh, Omali Yesitawa, uh, SNCC veteran, who has been able to implement what uh, was called for in the Atlanta Project position paper, or commonly known as the Black Power position paper, or the position paper for self-determination. I am um, 
honor to also and salute um, Penny, which really, who really brought the movement to my attention with her, her book. Um, over, overturning the culture of violence, um, bringing to bringing forward the broad definition, the spectrum of violence, which we are looking at and talking about today, that while uh, the murder, the physical murder of people is graphic and repulsive, many more people actually, in fact, are uh, murdered, mangled, destroyed uh, with coal violence, um, the, the denial of food, clothing, shelter, health care, clean air, clean water, access to technology, information, uh, leisure. And it's that coal violence that um, is, is lost and that uh, Penny's book uh, helped me to begin to uh, to frame and to begin to share with others in a, in a comprehensive kind of way. And to be on the panel with Akili, having watched you grow up in recent years and to mature as a, as a comrade um, is very affirming and reassuring for a generation who is passing the torch uh, on and feeling the need to be assured of its being received and advanced in a in a more effective way. So it is it is a pleasure and an honor to be with you all this afternoon. Yeah. The uh, description that Penny set out um, in the definition of genocide, the history of the uh, formation of the term and its application was uh, masterful. And I appreciate that and it makes my job uh, much easier. Uh, Achilles' description of the response of the party to the bogus assault of the U.S. government um, is in uh, not only insightful and inspiring, but instructive and lays the foundation for the pattern and practice, which actually has been advanced on an international level. The fact of the matter is, is, is that the uh, colonizers don't change their stripes. They don't change their practices. They simply uh, carry them from one uh, platform, as is said today, to the next. When we look at the international platform as represented by the United Nations, the reality is, is that it is modeled on the U.S. Uh, legal system, and it um, embodies all of the um, injustices. It embodies all of the lack of values, it embodies all of the political uh, machinations of the U.S. legal system, or as I call it, Anglo-U.S. jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. We are watching the uh, crowning of uh, Donald Trump um, with the, by the U.S. Uh, legal system, as was the case with uh, George Bush. Uh, suddenly, the uh, interest of individuals supersedes the interest of the, the masses of the people. When we look at the foreign foundation and the formation of the United Nations, it was created for the purposes of institutionalizing the global system uh, and regularizing the global colonial system, mm -hmm. a system that is built on the protection and promotion of the commercial interest of white male property owners. It has nothing, as we all know, to do 
with justice. As it relates to African people uh, in this country and abroad, it has consistently resisted even taking uh, cases that um, that uh, that we bring against the colonizer. For instance, and uh, we think readily of the 1951 recharge genocide case with Paul Robeson and Patterson and, and Du Bois and others. However, before that, in 1947, Du Bois actually frustrated the U.S. government uh, and the State Department specifically in bringing what it called a petition on behalf of the people, the, of uh, Negro people in the United States. There was a tremendous effort to prevent his presenting that uh, petition to the Secretary General. In fact, at that time, he was prevented from presenting it to the Secretary General while in the uh, General Assembly and the sec ultimately the Security Council, the fate of Palestine and the formation of the uh, U.S. project called Israel uh, was being debated. Du Bois was had to present the uh, statement to the Secretary of the Secretary General. And it's uh, progress through the system was repressed by the buying off of Walter White, who was the president of the NAACP at that time, and end up at, while Du Bois was also a member, and in fact, he was the um, executive director uh, uh, at that time. So uh, Walter White was given a position with the United Nations, and as soon after that, forced W.E.B. Du Bois out of the NAACP and crushed and quashed the petition on behalf of Negro people. Those politics have not changed. Today, mm -hmm. we see them in uh, Linda uh, Greenfield with her uh, continuing uh, vetoes on behalf of the U.S. government. We saw it uh, during the Iraq uh, war on Iraq with Colin Powell. We see Black people being used to carry water for uh, colonialism, imperialism, and to, to protect um, the colonizers from the, the uh, allegations or for being challenged for um, the, the uh, imperialists is the word I'm looking for, positions that, uh, that they use to advance colonialism. The assault on the Uhuru movement would be amusing if it were not so serious. That the, as Akili pointed out, the notion that we need some outsider to tell us that we are being oppressed um, could never ceases to not only uh, insult, but to amaze. I look back at um, historically when um, during the, the Cold War, earliest phases of the Cold War, where the United States minted um, half dollars, Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, half dollars, which were sold to Black people as a way of financing an anti, so-called anti-communist campaign. Those coins are still around and to remind us that the, that the, the insult and injury uh, is, is not only not new, but uh, as represented by the assault on the Uhuru movement uh, con per continues to this day. When we look at the United Nations, uh, two, the two judicial bodies, the International Criminal Court, which was founded in 2002 for the purposes of prosecuting individuals, 
uh, uh, accused of committing uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes and the like, now holding uh, 31 cases. The majority of those the defendants have, as we all know, uh, have been African people or other uh, heads of state of color. Hopefully, there will ultimately be a uh, country that will bring uh, a claim against uh, Joe Biden and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and these other criminals who are committing genocide against the Palestinian people. In the meantime, there has been uh, most recently the uh, complaint that was filed on behalf of the Palestinian people on the issue of occupation and the, the fact that the not getting to the root of the problem, and that is, is that uh, Israel, the Israeli project was superimposed on the Palestinian people in the first place, but that the uh, 1967 borders are impliedly or de facto established as the borders of Palestine and that uh, Israel is violating those borders, number one. And number two, it is, it is failing to fulfill its obligations to an occupied people, which is to not commit genocide and to protect their uh, right to, to live, which they have, Israel has completely um, uh, discounted and announced that it is going to and is denying the Palestinian people just basic food, uh, shelter, water, uh, medication, and destroyed the, the social and political and legal infrastructure that existed in the Gaza Strip. <clears throat> Excuse me, having in, enjoyed um, the protections of the uh, United Kingdom and the United States since its, its inception in 1948. In fact, it was the United States that uh, trained and armed the various so-called uh, liberation forces, terrorist gangs that they were uh, back in 1948 in order for them to steal the um, the land uh, and terrorize the people of Palestine. In 1940, uh, it was in 1948 that um, the International Court of Justice, or as it's commonly called, the World Court, was created. And it was actually created for the purposes of prosecuting Germany, uh, Italy, and Japan for its uh, having violated the Anglo order of the day. Mm -hmm. the, I, I want to say this before I, I leave the International Criminal Court, that the International Criminal Court um, has 31 cases that are open, and again, the majority of those are against um, Africans and uh, other persons of color, uh, heads of state of color. It is in the ICC that individuals are prosecuted as opposed to the ICJ, which was created in 1948, um, <clears throat> which prosecutes states or governments. <clears throat> Excuse me. It has, since its inception, 192 cases. Uh, 20 of which uh, remain in in uh, in progress. And the treatment of the, the previous um, ones range from uh, prosecution um, w with a final uh, judgment against a state to a to a uh, to dismissal. And it is, of course, the uh, application of the genocide convention that uh, brings it it brings the court into discussion today that is not its only um, jurisdiction but it is one that has received the greatest um, you know, use 
or attempted uh, attempted use. For those of us who were able um, to follow the uh, allegations of the of the uh, state of South Africa um, against the uh, I, I I cannot call it the state of Israel, the U.S. Uh, Israeli project. Um, we know that uh, the list has been uh, is cited in uh, Penny's definition of genocide, and in each instance, evidence was prevent presented to show that not only for the purposes of South Africa was the probability of genocide being created as the is the language of the court, but that it is in fact being created. Uh, it was uh, affirming to see the countries and the scholars that came together in order to create the the complaint and to argue that complaint. The um, the fact that the court came back with a, a de facto ceasefire, I know people are frustrated that there was no express call for uh, for a ceasefire, but the, the de facto uh, ceasefire goes into place in that the only way to implement the orders set out by the court is with a with a uh, with a, a, a ceasefire. It is, however, and and that's understandable when we look at the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court, for instance, in its order of the desegregation of public schools in this country by all with all deliberate speed, as opposed to uh, immediate, unconditional desegregation. Mm. Not that that was such a desirable goal or has served our purposes. But it leaves in the hands of the offender the just the uh, yeah. manner and time in which it will, if it does, uh, implement the order of the court. And that is precisely what has been done with the ICJ's uh, mm -hmm. opinion to call on Israel to uh, fulfill its humanitarian obligations without expressly calling for a ceasefire. It could not, in all candor, call for an express ceasefire because the court, like the U.S. Supreme Court, has no authority. It has no army. It can only articulate its position, its opinion, and then it's left to others to implement it. Um, the fact of the, the matter is, is that given its own, uh, con the court's own concern about its credibility, it's concerned about its continued political existence by, as represented by its donors, um, it has to take into consideration the, the kind of uh, decisions and opinions that it issues in light of its own survival. So mm. the United States having been the president, uh, a citizen of the United States, having mm -hmm. been one of the 19 jurists um, and the president of the court uh, did what was in its interest uh, the best uh, that it could, could do uh, under the circumstances uh, and and maintain its own dignity. Of the 192 cases that have been heard and the 20 remaining cases, they are again a uh, range of cases that focus largely on matters that affect um, countries, African countries and South American countries. Um, with against European countries, which of course the outcome can be readily predicted as marginal as best and uh, minimal uh, more more uh, more likely than not. Um, 
I would uh, stop at this point and allow for the further comments to be in response to questions that uh, that might be asked. Uhuru. Uhuru. And I, I really, I really appreciate your present, your presentation. And I was thinking that, you know, I, I really appreciate your premise that you start with that the United Nations is a tool of maintaining the colonial domination and imperialist power. And uh, I think that maybe you are the only expert on the United Nations that starts from that premise. And that is very powerful and really appreciate all of the information that you gave us. And we, you know, this is a really important discussion and understanding um, about that. So thank you very much for that very, very important presentation. And we are gonna go to our next presenter, which is Comrade Tafari Mugheri, who is on the ground in occupied Zania or South Africa. And, you know, we're doing this as was mentioned by Comrade Athea, um, knowing that, that South Africa did bring to the world court uh, the question of genocide against that was taking place or is taking place right before our eyes against the Palestinian people, um, but without talking about the conditions of African people in the what is called South Africa today. So yeah, so welcome, Chair Tafari. It is an honor to have you with us today. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru comrades. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, on this, uh, you know, um, special event uh, of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, you know, this uh, annual national convention. So I really salute all of you comrades for the work that you've been doing. I wanna, you know, congratulate you for this, uh, you know, already successful um, convention, you know. Uh, I, I just want to, you know, special salute to, you know, the leadership of, uh, the solidarity front of this international African revolution, uh, Chairwoman Penny Hayes, uh, Comrade uh, Chair uh, Jesse Neville, and all the organizers over there. And I, I really want to, uh, you know, express you know my profound appreciation to Comrade Afia, you know, for this, uh, you know, the the presentation she's just made here, very informative. You know, it it, it helps a lot just to get the the context and the details in terms of, you know, everything regarding this uh, question of genocide in Palestine and so forth, right? Now, I salute Comrade Director Akile, Anayi, uh, you know, and um, I really want to salute my leadership, uh, the leader of the International African Revolution, Chairman Omali Eshitela, uh, you know, so I am in South Africa, um, and uh, I, 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 I am part of the South Africa or Azania front of the international African revolution because, you know, we are colonized everywhere. And I really want to appreciate Chairman Omali Hitela for having this vision of, you know, you know, continuing the legacy of Marcus Garvey, you know, that project of consolidating the international African revolution so that we can begin to realize that the contradictions that we are faced with in South Africa, they are not just uh, you know, like absolutely peculiar to South Africa, just, you know, because we, we get too caught up in in these, uh, you know, um, politics that happen within these, uh, you know, uh, colonial borders that we are confined in. Like right now in South Africa, there's going to be elections uh, on the, on, in, in May. This is an election election year. And, uh, you know, so when you listen to all the political organizations, you know, they speak of South Africa as if it's something that exists in its own planet and, uh, the, you know, it's not implicated by what's happening in the world and so forth, right? Uh, so I, I, I just want to, you know, like, appreciate the fact that we are here and we are able to speak from different parts of the, uh, of, of the world. And, uh, you know, just to speak in terms of uh, the, the conditions in, 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 in South Africa, I want to acknowledge one thing. Uh, for sure, that we're speaking of uh, Palestine, right? 
uh, and, uh, and 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 as as a and also speaking about uh, the United States, uh, you know, refusing to uh, you know to 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 vote for the ceasefire uh, over there in Gaza, uh, and and also you know supporting Israel on its uh, brutal assault and genocide against the Palestinian people over there, but then. This is uh it's it's understandable that the US would do this, would take this position, like Comrade che, Chairwoman Penny Hess was saying, is because that's how the U- United States was born. It was mm-hmm. born the same way that um, you know, like uh Israel wants to legitimize itself. So over the years, the United States has been legitimizing itself to say that. The United States is authentic, it's, it's, there is legitimate and so forth, right? And Israel was the same status. So they want to wipe out the, the Palestinian people. And you, when, uh, when you look at Israel and you look at the United States, both of them, they are settler colonies. And at the same time, I'm here in South Africa and I also live in a settler colony. So South Africa also is a settler colony. Um, yeah. Although in South Africa, unlike in the U.S., African people, you know, continue to be the majority. You know, like more than 70 percent of the population here is African people. Sometimes they call us colors and they say colors are different from blacks and things like that. You know, things that don't make sense, you know. So, you know, with African internationalism, we also learn that uh, we are African people wherever we are. They call us colors here. They call us Negroes here. They call us whatever. You know, so it's 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 um uh, colonialism is is something that we really experience and uh we can be able to articulate it with this uh, political theory of African internationalism. So in South Africa, being a, a be a, being a, a a settler colony, uh, African people here, as much as we are the majority, uh, we don't have uh you know like control over anything that happens in in South Africa. We don't have control over the mineral resources. Uh, we don't have control over the uh, the, the the land itself. Uh, like right now, I'm in a township. I live in South Africa. I grew up in a township. And I was just thinking that every time when I walk, going to my colonial job here, uh, you see like, like these white people that come into the community here. Uh, I don't know what you call, you call them trucks. They come with trucks. And uh, and to collect African people, you know, they, they won't get go deep into the township, but then just on the like where the township starts and the edges of the township, they'll just park their uh, their trucks there, and then African people will come and jump on 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 the trucks, and then they go and work, and then they deliver them back. This this happens on a daily basis, and when you come to think of it, uh, it it makes sense. It's because we are colonized. And uh, if we are fighting against, uh, you know, the concept of racism, uh, you'd say, no, they're just giving them a job and things like that. Therefore, they're not racist. And then, you know, they are fine. These are some good white people. But then uh, this is stolen black labor, you know, because in the township right now, uh, there, there's, uh, there's trash everywhere. Uh, you know, like waste is not being collected. Uh, you know, like um, there's, there's a lot of streets without... Uh, uh, that are not uh, tarred, they, they, they don't have, uh, you know, they just it's just a gravel road, you know, it, it's gravel road, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of dust. Uh, S.G. Lewis was here, uh, and Chairman Normal as well, uh, he was here in 2018. When you look at the streets, it's a lot of dust here that affects African people all the time, and then, uh, but then we have people, African people that work on a daily basis. Who are we working for? when we get collected by these white people to go and work uh, in their communities or work in their companies. So it's colonialism altogether. And this helps us a lot to understand um, uh, what, what, uh, what, what we, are, we are dealing with. And when you look at the township, townships in South Africa uh, were created, especially after the second um, imperialist war, after the 1940s and the 1950s, right? Uh, so a lot of townships were created around that time and uh, they were created as labor reserves. You know, when in South Africa, the Nationalist Party was beginning to industrialize uh, a lot here in South Africa, you know, so you got African people coming from 
Mozambique, coming from Zimbabwe and coming all over from all, like from all over. That's why you have that song by, by Huma Sigela that says, um, Istimela, you know, about this train that collects African people throughout Southern Africa to come and work in the mines, you know? So this is, it, it's real. It, 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 it's a real thing. Uh, that's why you cannot even speak about, uh, you know, like uh, like the legitimacy of the colonial borders because South Africa itself was built by the labor of African people throughout uh, Africa. Not just those that, not, that that are called South African, so-called South African black people. It's African people from from everywhere that came to work in the mines, work in the factories, and so forth. You know, so so. But then today, uh, like when you look at the the platform that a lot of uh of, of organization are com- organizations are campaigning on right now, it's around the question of immigrants. You know, they 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 say African people from Zimbabwe. You know that that's where the, the the primary contradiction is. You know, uh, they taking jobs, they taking you know, there's a lot of crime and so forth because of immigrants. You know, and they they saying that these are illegal immigrants. They calling African people illegal immigrants, but then at the same time, the the, the real immigrants, the real foreigners, are uh, right. from from Europe uh, that that came here uninvited, that uh, murdered uh, millions of African people for. Uh, you know, for centuries, they they are called citizens. They are called fellow citizens. You know, uh, and 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 they and and white people being seven percent of the population here, they own uh like seventy two percent of the uh, agricultural land. You know, but then this is just the agricultural land. Uh, like consider also that they own the mines. Consider uh, that they own also the space that's not con- considered like. Uh, like agricultural, where they have all these factories and and, and so forth. So it's more than 80% or maybe even 90% of the land that the the colonial white, uh, you know, like settler population uh, owns here in terms of of the land. And African people were crammed in the townships. Right now, if I can just, you know, like go outside, you will see the type of uh, situation that's here, you know. Uh, like uh, you know, like these houses made of corrugated iron and so forth. These are these are the living conditions in South Africa today. The 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 the, the income and wealth gap uh, between the, the the settler colonial uh, you know like uh, white population and the African colonized population here is wider today. As much as they would like like to to hide it and say now nah, uh, you have a lot of black elites that have begun to make it right now, like the South African president Ramaphosa. Uh, he's, he's he's in the top ten of the, the the wealthiest people in South Africa right now, and then somehow he's supposed to represent black people, and he doesn't represent pe- black people because he's he's with them, you know he's there to advance their policies, you know and 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 um like for example in uh 2012, uh in 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 the northwest province, uh in uh in Marikana. Uh, the, 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 there's a company from from Britain at uh, the London Mine, London Mine Company, and uh, and 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 you had mine workers protesting there, uh, demanding to get um twelve thousand twelve twelve thousand five hundred rands. I don't know how much twelve thousand five hundred rands is in dollars, you know. And and uh, I mean just to get a raise, you know, not not to get the mine itself, which is like the mines belong to us as African people. Just to get a raise, uh, they, they they ended up getting gunned down, and uh, but by 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 the set by by the colonial police, yeah, by by the by the state police, you know, uh, in, in in South Africa. And whenever there's, you know, there's um, there, there's a heated struggle between the the police and and the working class, they always call you know the white cops, you know, like in the townships usually you won't see white cops. But then if it becomes something serious, you know, they, they're going to call, call white cops because they'll be less merciful. They won't be considerate of anything because they don't have family members amongst those people that are protesting there, you know. So it's easy for them to kill, uh, you know, without mercy, uh, you know. So so you had like 34 mine workers being gunned down in in, in, in 2012. And, uh, and, and Cyril, Cyril Ramaphosa, who is the, the president today, had shares in that London mine. He had shares. Actually, he's the one who who 
uh, who called the commissioner or police to, to deal with those mine workers to say that deal with them and they ended up dying like that and now he is the president and somehow he's supposed to represent black people because he has our complexion you know and he speaks the, in like the same language uh, that that we speak here you know so this is neocolonialism uh, all all together it's neocolonialism all together and as much as south africa uh, the the anc government uh took uh israel to the um uh, uh international uh, uh what is it called court of justice court of justice uh as much as it it, it did that uh it, it 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 forgot to speak about uh the the occupation here in south africa of african <laughs> people you know they didn't speak about the occupation here they're speaking about the occupation in which is we support that we unite with that of course you know but then they are not addressing the issues in south africa of African people, the colonized masses of African people here, they're not addressing those issues at all. You know, so that's why even when we talk about the question of solidarity, uh, the, um, yeah, I'm left with one minute. When you talk about the question of solidarity, the white people that, uh, you know, you know, want to see a world shown of oppression, uh, you know, colonialism and so forth, have to hear the oppressed black masses, not the African petty bourgeoisie, you know, because Ramaphosa is black, and you may support Ramaphosa, but you're not supporting black people through right Ramaphosa, supporting Ramaphosa. Right. So right you on. have to listen to the African People's Socialist Party because the African People's Socialist Party represents the African working class. You know, I'm I'm speaking from South Africa in the townships where we are organizing, we're building uh, the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement here. We're building branches throughout South Africa. We're building branches in Namibia, building branches in Zambia. Uh, in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in, in Nigeria, in Benin. I'm only mentioning places where uh, the party is, is established itself right now. You know, so, and this is the people on the ground working, uh, you know, to, to overturn the, 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 the colonial, uh, you know, conditions that uh, we are subjected to. So I'm going to end it there, comrades. I really salute this, um, this convention. And I believe that the, the USM is going to grow uh, even in South Africa, we need the USM in South Africa. You know, this 7% colonial white population, uh, any white person that's in South Africa, that's, uh, you know, so-called, you know, uh, pro-black or suppose, uh, you know, African people, they have to build the USM in South Africa. Uhuru. Uh -huh. Uhuru. Uhuru. Director Tafari McGarry, that was powerful. And I just want to say to our comrades from Uhuru Solidarity Movement that are here, that you see pictures of Cape Town and Johannesburg, and there are these beautiful yeah. state-of-the-art yeah. cities. But when, when Director Tafari is talking about township, I just want to be clear, you know, it is it is based on the reservations that are the most impoverished sector inside the borders of the United States that indigenous people are forced on. That's what it's based on. And you you could hear, oh, township. Oh, okay, a little town. No, a township is a kind of reservation where African people on their own land live in corrugated tin shacks. I wish if we had a picture of a township, um, we can put it up there. And the average size is, of each so-called little house is about as big as the stage. Um, yeah. This is the conditions that African people on their own land today are forced in and to live in. And if you aren't outraged by that reality, we have to we have to look at the world as it really is. And I just appreciate that brilliant, really powerful presentation and the work that is being done there to organize the African People's Socialist Party and the African Revolution under the leadership of Chairman Omali Shatella throughout the continent of Africa. And the chairman may talk about that, I don't know, but I, it's my honor to um, to introduce Chairman Omali Shatella um, and chairman, welcome. Uhura. Uhura Tamaz. First of all, I just want to salute uh, these incredible forces on this panel. And uh, 
I have to send a special shout out, of course, to Comrade Fia Mungaza, uh, who uh, from the SNCC days. And uh, um, I just want to start out by recognizing some of the very significant things that she, she mentioned. And part of what she stated uh, is that uh, the work that we have done uh, in terms of even uh, taking the uh, United States uh, to a world tribunal of our own in 1982 in Brooklyn, New York, based on international law, including the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, that this work has started a long time ago uh, by Africans, that we've done this for a long time. This is not a new phenomenon. And I think it's really important to say that because the United States government, of course, has charged us with the crime, claiming that the Russians are the ones who initiated this process. And uh, uh, I think it's important to, to say this. And the only reason that uh, they uh, think they can get away with this is because it's the African People's Socialist Party that has existed long enough and consistent enough to continue to pursue it. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they kill people, they jail people, uh, they terrorized folk, and then they raised up a sector of the African population, like the Ramaphosa's that we're looking at right now in South Africa, and say, these are the representatives of Black people. <laughs> and so I just think it's really important to say that, that, that this is an ongoing struggle, and it's being brought back to the surface as a consequence of the work of the African People's Socialist Party, one, two. <clears throat> I think it's important to say that even more recently, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, uh, it established uh, the basic formula for what it is that we're doing right here today in terms of this uh, meeting, this convention, <clears throat> the existence of the African People's Solidarity Committee uh, uh, and USM. Uh, it was a student nonviolent coordinating committee that took told white people, leave this organization. But how you are dominating the organizations and contaminating the consciousness of people and how people are viewing this struggle around the world, including African people ourselves, go back to the white community where the, versus the source of the contradiction organized there. And of course, what happened was the, the, the white uh, members of, uh, of uh, SNCC at that time, they declared they were betrayed uh, <clears throat> by our movement and as much sacrifice and work hard as they worked for us, <clears throat> that uh, this was a horrible thing. And so they went and discovered other things. This is where the white left discovered Vietnam. Of course, the Vietnamese helped, helped them discover Vietnam too, because it's safer, to, <laughs> it's safer, you know, uh, to be against this war than to keep sitting, uh, you know, uh, uh, or you can invest, get stocks and body bags, because that's what the Vietnamese was helping people to understand. Yeah. But the point is that the, the white so-called left, the white movement, and then when SNCC in 1967 uh, came out in solidarity uh, with the struggle of the Palestinian people, uh, uh, all of the white liberals uh, took their money, Jews and other white liberals uh, took their money from SNCC, uh, leaving many organizers in places in Mississippi where we're being murdered except about transportation of any of these resources because they took their money back. So this is a punitive attack that they made on us. You talk about free speech, you're talking about the government uh, working against free speech, but the, it was something that was generalized. And African po the white population was willing to also assault African people uh, for engaging in free speech uh, if that free speech had challenged the, the colonial status that they they enjoyed. So I wanted to say that uh, and and uh, and to acknowledge uh, Comrade Afia. I'm so proud of the fact that she's still in the trenches. You know, it has been in the trenches and she's gone through all kinds of stuff. She got a radio station that she's trying to use to put these words out. The radio station has been under attack. Her law degree has been under attack and what have you. Uh, and she's been in the trenches. That's, you know, and SNCC, you have to understand something about SNCC because SNCC was that bridge between the civil rights movement and the African liberation movement. And, and it was SNCC, the forces who, some of whom are still in Africa, or if they're not, they may have died by now, but they went to Africa. And of course they were, they were uh, Malcolmites too. They were connected to Malcolm X and what have you, who was, you know, like an extraordinary force. I wanted to say that, welcome comrade Akwaba, uh, comrade uh, uh, Afia, and thank you so much, yeah. yeah. Secondly, I just want to say we raised uh, yesterday 20,000 uh, and four hundred dollars in in just in just a, in just a couple of hours 
And we are talking about uh, putting uh, colonialism and the colonizers on trial. <clears throat> we did that in just a couple of hours. The United States government says that we were working for the Russians because they can trace some $7,000, they say, that we got from this NGO, this Russian non-government organization, over a period of six years. <laughs> six years! They say, they know we're working for the U.S., for the Russian government, because over a six-year period, they gave us uh, the, uh, this NGO, not the Russian government, a non-governmental organization, uh, they said, uh, gave us, uh, what was it, $7,000 of a six-year period. And so that, we were working pretty cheaply back then. <laughs> and, you know, and, just, uh, and just yesterday, in a couple of hours, in a couple of hours, we raised $10,400, $20,400. Yeah. So this, this is just an extraordinary yeah. thing. So... Uh, I just wanted to make that point because this is part of the trial that we are putting colonialism on. And uh, also, I think it's really important, uh, Comrade Penny Hess, when she opened up the presentation, she talked about how uh, the the white left and the anti and the people who were uh, uh, anti nuke people refused to support us when when we were struggling in this question in the California Bay Area. Uh, we were fighting them tooth and nail. We were occupying buildings and stuff like that to house homeless people, et cetera. And the, and the county commissioner wanted to put them uh, in this, this abandoned, I think it's something like 20, it was 21 years that had been abandoned or something like that. They had used for nuclear testing, wanted to nuke the homeless people by putting them in this place. Radioactive. Radioactive joint. It was, and it was the, they, they stopped it because it was radioactive. But they were going to put the homeless people, most of whom were African, in a nuclear radio, a radioactive joint. And so this is one of the reasons that Comrade Penny was saying that this whole issue of genocide became a factor. But a fundamental reason was that we were dealing with this question of foster children. That's right. Because there's a foster child racket. Yes, that they steal yes. black babies, you know, sometime at birth. Sometime a woman gives birth to the baby and they take the baby at that moment. And there's a racket where there are some entities in, in California. We saw entities that had 9,000, was it 900 bears, 900. right? 900 bears. Yeah. These are black babies that they are taking at birth. And yeah. it's a racket. And they were getting paid to take the babies from poor African women oh. who, in most instances, didn't have enough resources to feed their children well. Uh, and they would take the children and, again, give these white, mostly white foster parents money for doing that. In one instance, what was her name, Yvonne? What? Eldridge. Eldridge. One, one instance, this woman, Yvonne yeah. Eldridge, who would take these black babies and then take them to doctors and have the doctors to commit, uh, uh, to operate on them, cutting out their spleen, sometimes was in intravenous stuff with fecal matter going into the babies, et cetera. And part of the reason they would do this is because they get more money if there's something wrong with the children, right? And, you know, we had instances of where uh, they take, take black babies, they cut off all the hair of the black girls, uh, or they put perms in an infant, you know, put permanent stuff in the black baby's hair because they didn't know how to take care of the child's hair, or they put a ball around the bald head child, black baby. Uh, and then the excuse that was given for El Yvonne Eldridge's crimes against our community was that she uh, was afflicted by this thing, non Munchausen uh, much, much, much by proxy. By proxy stuff. And so she was just having this disease that made it necessary for her to always see doctors. And that's why she was doing it. But she didn't do it to her own white children. She was doing it to the African children that she was having. And so we were talking about this, this thing that we're doing to black children. And according to, even to the genocide convention, that is genocide taking the babies yeah. of our children. Yeah. This white woman who was on the council, yeah. on, the, on the commission, said, how dare you use this term genocide? When what has happened to the Jews? How in the hell are you going to say anything about genocide, et cetera? This was how they, they treated African people and continue to treat African people. So I just wanted to, to make that point. I'm going to be trying to be as quick as I can. 
uh, I think that uh, this uh, uh, the, 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 this the struggle that we're involved in is putting colonialism on trial. Yes. Uh, the continued resistance of the colonized is putting colonialism on trial. The thing is that they do everything they can to disappear us, to make us non-existent, because our very existence is evidence of a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, our very existence. How the hell did I come to this territory of indigenous people occupied by settlers who came and kidnapped me from Africa so that I couldn't be there with, with a comrade Tafari? How the hell did I get here? And so Biden wants to say something, I guess the Russians, he didn't even say the Russians explained it to me. No, because I'm supposed to have just popped up uh, from beneath a collard green leaf or something on a cotton plantation in Mississippi. That's the beginning, that's the origin of our existence. You understand? But the fact is we were kidnapped. We were kidnapped by brutal murderers and, and we can't even get into the depth of the crimes and offenses and brutality that was imposed on African people. I mean, it's horrendous to kind of stuff. It's almost impossible to describe what they did to us, what they did to the indigenous people. Did you know when they got here, they trained dogs, mm -hmm. uh, dogs who to attack indigenous people, they trained them to attack the indigenous and tear their intestines out. These were trained dogs that they did. They, they, when they got here, there were no horses. So what did they do when they wanted to go from place to place? They jumped on the back of an Indian, a so-called Indian, didn't rob that indigenous person. You've seen the pictures of, of the white man in the structures being carried by Africans or, or in the pictures of Africa. This is part of it. And this, but you may not have seen the pictures of the beheaded, uh, uh, the people who have been beheaded. You've seen the mountains of hands uh, that they cut off uh, uh, in, in Congo and what have you. So, and then, and then, so, but the worst crime that's ever been created in the world was the crime committed by white people against other white people. And that's the thing that's used to pummel, to beat down uh, any kind of, of uh, evidence of the crimes that's committed against the rest of us. Like that white woman said, how the hell can you say murdering and tormenting and taking black babies uh, is equal to what happened to those white people in Germany uh, uh, by, that was done to them by other white people? by other white people. And so the Palestinians are supposed to be paying the price for that right now. And if I said I'm paying the price, I'm an anti-Semite, I'm, I'm against the Jews, uh, if I say this, and, Mount, and it's Farrakhan, you know, Farrakhan didn't do it. Uh, even this silly guy, Kanye West, didn't do it. Uh, the basketball player didn't do it. White people did that to white people. Colonizers did that to white people. And what were colonizers doing? They were imitating the very same things with other white people that they got doing to black people, to indigenous people and oppressed people around the world. That was what they did. And now they liquidate what they've done to us uh, by making the hor most horrible, horrific crime uh, in history that they've done to other white people. And you can't mention that. Mm -hmm. And when they take us to trial, we start, we don't have any history. We don't have any history. Mm -hmm. uh, we were created by the white man uh, uh, and then uh, our problem is uh, after the white man created us and brought us here, uh, we found some more white people who uh, we want to be our masters. And so the Russians invented us after uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, I guess we're some kind of, uh, I almost said Frankenstein monster or something to that effect, but that may, that may fit the, the bill. And, but you know, if you look at various evidence that you see, I want to, I got to expedite this. Show me, show me the clock. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you look at even things like, uh, uh, how many of you saw, uh, I read the book even, uh, I think it was written by, did Orwell write this book? Uh, the Island of Dr. Moreau? Who wrote, H.G. Uh, so. Wells. H.G. Yeah. Wells wrote the book. Uh, the, the Island of Dr. Moreau. This was something written in the 18, late 1800s and what have you. And the island of Dr. Moreau is where this white guy, uh, uh, boat, his boat crashes and he's on this island and he, 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 he's there and this guy, Dr. Moreau, you should catch this movie, by the way, if you can. Catch it, has been made into a movie a couple of times, but I think the most effective one stars Burke Lancaster as the evil doctor. And what they're doing is they're taking animals 
And they got these animals who they are trying to turn into human beings, right? And they create a law for the animals. And anytime the animals act more like animals than they do like human beings, which is why, uh, they take them to the house of pain and they torture them and they go, what is the law, et cetera. And this is what we are looking at now, the law of Dr. Moreau, who treats the rest of us like brutes. With no history of our own, we were created like, like the animals, uh, like the people who were created by Dr. Moreau. That's, that's part of the legacy of colonialism. This is born out of the colonial project. That's where this whole philosophy comes from that would create that kind of movie. And so uh, I think that's, you know, I just wanted to, uh, to throw that out. The other thing I want to say quickly is that uh, uh, when you look at uh, what we are confronted with now, we're talking about Palestine. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, Russia, because uh, this is in the thing, because we're charged with being agents of Russia, because uh, the United States is making war against Russia that didn't just start now, it started more than 100 years ago, right after the Russian Revolution. And the Russian Revolution was pushed to the surface by the struggles of colonized peoples around the world in a war, the so-called First World War, that was being made to redivide the world between colonial powers. And the Russians refused to participate in that project under Lenin. And this mm. is the thing that, that, that made uh, the rest of the European powers attack Russia. But what else was going on at this time? The Ottoman Empire. Uh, 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 was was under assault, was under, and the Ottoman Empire con controlled much of the area where you find Muslims in the, uh, uh, in, in, in that region of the world, the Ottoman Empire was, was crushing, was, co was collapsing. And Germany united with the Ottoman Empire in defense of itself against the other colonial powers. And so the deal was made uh, called, uh, uh, well, two things happened. That's what the Balfour Declaration came about in order to unite Jews with the effort to keep the Jews on side of uh, England uh, and the other powers uh, that was fighting against Germany and the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. And how did the world find out about that? The Russian Revolution. Mm -hmm. Trotsky spilled the beans. They Because mm -hmm. the, the Russia was supposed to be a part of it, but Russia had pulled out of the deal uh, with them uh, and the Russian Revolution pulled them out of the deal, and then they got the archives. And in the archives, they found the, this whole Balfour Declaration, and it was the Russians that exposed it uh, to the whole world. Uh, but at the same time, you had what was going on was you had the, what was it called? The, the Pico, what was it? The Sykes-Pico Sykes deal. Yeah. Sykes-Pico was a, 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 an arrangement that had been made uh, uh, by the French and the British. Mm -hmm. Another secret arrangement, by the way, this is what the Russians really uh, ex uh, broke the, let everybody know about. The Sykes Pico, they had made a deal to split up this, the borders that you see now and the so called Middle East were created by French and Russians. Mm -hmm. Even modern Syria, modern Lebanon, Palestine. The modern territories, et cetera, created between the French and, and, and the British. And the Russians blew the, uh, let it, everybody know that this secret deal that they had made, et cetera. And this is part, of, and my point, two points. One, it was the colonial struggle. It was the struggle that peoples around the world were making. It was the intent of the colonial powers to redivide the world. They were fighting for a new deal, just like mafioso forces do. Every now and then, they don't like the last deal they got, so they start another war to, to change the arrangement. And this is what happened. So the Ottoman Empire is collapsing. They want all of that territory. The debate of struggle is going to happen. Who's going to get those territories? So you got Germany hooked up with the Ottoman Empire. You got uh, the French, the British, and other forces on one side of the question. And then you've got the, the French uh, and the British uh, who make this deal. You got the Balfour Declaration coming into it, and, and, and Sykes played a role at Balfour. Sykes participated in developing the Balfour Declaration. All of this stuff about the poor Jews, my ass. Right, yeah. right, right. And so I just think it's really important to have some history. 
to have a grip Absolutely. on that stuff. Otherwise, you yeah. work against your own interests. Yeah. You work. And let me just say, final thing, and I see this thing that says, this, this comrade has got this signed up. Uh, like she's talking to imperialism, it says, the end of time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I really think it's important for everybody to understand this because it took me a while to understand how Marx and, and Lenin and other so-called Marxists and revolutionaries could talk about how uh, the advent of capitalism was progressive in, world, in, in, in human history. You remember that? They say that this was progressive. Mm -hmm. And they talk right. even about uh, what happened, uh, 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 you know, you have now you've got uh, constitutional rights and First Amendments and, and the, even the so-called American Revolution, progressive, right? And the American mm -hmm. Revolution is made on the foundation of indigenous land and black labor. Mm -hmm. Stolen mm -hmm. black labor, that's where it came right. from. Right. But what right. made it progressive? What made it progressive is because Europeans were fighting against feudalism. They were right. fighting against the nobility. They were fighting against kings and stuff, and they had no rights at all except the rights that were afforded to them by the nobility. And the, where the nobility and the, and the nobility got us, the king got us right from where? It was divine rights. It was given by God. That's why they had such things as the first night the priest had the first night open with a new bride to find out if she was really a virgin. <laughs> Okay, you passed the test. Next, you know, uh, this is this is what they were trapped with, right? And so anything is better than that. So they steal these people's land that they have African people working on to create all the wealth and resources, and they make some laws to make sure that they will never have a situation where the priests and the kings and stuff like that can tell them what yeah, to do. They yeah, could not speak, yeah. and so their laws said yeah. they have a constitution. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of uh, what is that? What about the uh, un? Uh, what is the uh, un illegal search and seizures? Yeah. You can't do any of those things to them. But that didn't include me. It didn't include black people. It didn't include the indigenous people. So it was quote unquote progressive. The problem they had was they were promoting themselves around the world, not just here, England and what have you. Uh, 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 as as being now a government uh, based on rule of by law, you know, et cetera. And th all of these wonderful democracies were supposed to extend to everybody except us. And this is where the whole issue of exceptionalism comes in mm -hmm. uh, and uh, has been put forward. That, that the, the, cause the question got raised and there were great debates that were happening within Europe uh, and uh, philosophers Locke and, 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 and what's the H what the, and other forces having these debates and they came up with theories. They're talking about people sacrifice their rights a handful so that uh, uh, you've sacrificed some of your rights so that you can have other rights and things like that. Uh, but the, the question was, why can you call yourself this great democracy based on rule by law, on the one hand, when you do anything you want to do to black people, mm -hmm. to other people that you got colonized and what have you. And so this is where they came up with the exceptionalism. This, uh, and the exceptional thing was that uh, 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 they uh, permit themselves to do this uh, to others, uh, uh, to bring them up to the level of civilization. Right. And when they become right. civilized, then they enjoy right. the same rights. And even up until the League of Nations, which preceded the, UN. the United Nations, right? Uh, the League of Nations uh, put forth uh, self-determination is one of the things that it upheld. But it was self-determination for civilized people. So that even when Black people went to the United Nations, talking about self-determination, they had to offer evidence of being a civilized people. And the colonizers, the ones who enslaved us, the ones who beheaded us, the ones who cut off our hands and stuff like that, if we didn't pick enough, uh, uh, create enough rubber for them, they determine what was civilized. And that's still at work today. And that's why it's necessary for deny us any kind of history. And history begins with the advent of white people and white people themselves came uh, as a consequence of colonialism was no such thing as white people, no such thing as Europe before slavery and colonialism, etc. And that's the contradiction, but that's their contradiction because I am not trying to turn Joe Biden to an African internationalist. I don't think he could, he could get that. 
you know, uh, uh, and I'm not trying to, uh, what I am saying, first of all, I think white people suffer mightily because think about this, who perceive themselves as, as only having a choice as leaders, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. It's, think what a fucking Trump trap that must be. Wow, look at my leaders. I got a Trump or a Biden, right? And, and this is an extraordinary dilemma, it seems to me. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I would that would drive me crazy. I believe, uh, uh, and perhaps that is what's happening. You know, uh, <laughs> but this is a serious dilemma. I'm not trying to turn them into African internationalists. They have promoted the notion that uh, things like First Amendment, free speech, etc., are foundational. Yes. To this yes. civilization they've created, yes. they've won yes. that among white people, etc. So I'm not trying to make you an African internationalist. I'm gonna make you hold up to what you say you believe in. So here I am, here I am. I don't, I, I know as Malcolm X once said, I'm not a Republican or I'm Democrat and I'm not an American. I got enough sense to know it, right? But you are the ones who say that you believe in this. This is what you hold to be foundational. This is what I am pushing you to be able to hold up to. So we say, we didn't do a damn thing they said we did. We say that uh, uh, even though Mamiya didn't shoot the cops, he, he should have, uh, but he, you know, uh, we in those kinds of situations, but uh, we didn't do anything that they said we did. But if we had done it, the First Amendment protects us from being able yeah. to say that. So even yeah. if you don't believe what I believe in, in terms of African people being, being colonized, you believe in the First Amendment. That's the only thing I'm trying to hold you to, generally speaking. I'm holding the people in this room and in this meeting to African internationalism. <laughs> but generally speaking, if you held to, to, to this, uh, well, let's go out in the world and win everybody to recognition and unity with the First Amendment rights of African people. Because what they would do, they attack somebody who they presume to be unpopular. Yeah. And then they would use that to attack your First Amendment rights. They never did intend them to be my First Amendment rights. But if they can use an attack on me, uh, uh, and the prejudice that they think they have promoted uh, that have come along with being a colonizer, if they can use that to attack me, it's a form of jujitsu uh, that they use this weight against you. It's you they're coming for. I'm just standing between you and the state that wants to get your ass, right? And so you need to be able to join this movement. And how many new members did we get yet? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to got another. <laughs> So, Comrade Leah, Comrade Leah, subtract some of my time from, from that of the imperialists. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was, that was incredible. That was all right. <laughs> and I know. We are over time, but do we get to, can we have some questions? Can we have a little bit of discussion? Uhuru, I see somebody's hand up. I can't see all the way back there, but. Uh, I just wanted to make the point. There's something else about Sykes Pico, which was uh, the Go British. The mic, the come up, come to the mic, uh, Red Beard. Where is Red that? Beard is a stalwart African international, has been one for a long time in the trenches for real. Absolutely. <laughs> the party. Right on. The ATSC. Right on. <laughs> uh, another thing about Sykes people was they promised the indigenous people that if they lined up uh, behind the British and French and fought the uh, Ottomans, that yeah. they would get their independence. Yeah. So they kept it a secret, and then they uh, they didn't give them their independence. Right. 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 Typical colonizer. Yeah. Uh -huh. I have a, a question, comment, slash. Um, yeah, I just so appreciate this discussion. I feel like it was really, really powerful. And when you were um, raising the thing, Penny, about the woman at the Alameda Board of Supervisors that was crying and right. saying, you can't use the word genocide, I got to wait. That was during the foster care. Right, oh, okay. right, right. The chairman, right. The chairman, yeah. the chairman mentioned. Yeah. And it really made me realize the whole thing about, but that made your point anyway. Yeah. You know, and it showed yeah. the limitations of the single issue 
organizations. Yeah. Right. Because if you're just talking about foster care, or if you're just talking about nuclear, or right. if you're just talking about the environment, or right. housing, right. 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 and the thing that the leadership of the strategy of the African Revolution does is it brings it all together. It it's all comes under the conditions of colonialism. So you have to deal with every single aspect of life. And to me, that is one of the things that's so important about this movement, because if you're just struggling about the one piece, as the party has said so many times, okay, you solve um, you know, something about women and feminism, and then problems are solved, and we can keep imperialism going. And um, but the um, wait, and we had one more thing that I had to. to well, say I appreciate about that, that point but, that you're making. But, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. But I just wanted to to say that thing because if we take a stand under the leadership of the African movement as white people against colonialism, we can unite with the future of humanity. But if we don't, if we're stuck in those single issue things. We end up uniting, um, you know, with imperialism. That's right. And that's the thing, too, about why it's the white left that's so afraid of with the Russians. Yeah. And even the so-called progressive media doesn't want to touch it. And nobody wants to talk about, nobody that considers themselves progressive hardly will deal with the issue of, you know, coming out and taking a stand in solidarity with the party because they're afraid of the whole Russia issue, because of that not wanting to unite with being against colonialism. Well, the colonial question is a critical question, you see, because what we see today, uh, if you talk about the question being like against racism, like that's what they did in South Africa, if you will. Uh, they put the thing is that what people in South Africa are fighting for is the end of racism, the end of apartheid, which is the same thing we've supposed to been fighting for here. And so you got since the apartheid, the form of which is a form of the state, mm -hmm. since the apartheid is the form of the state no longer exists, then they say, well, everything is over. Uh, but the economic system that's stealing all the resources, the coin thing still exists. And that's the same thing true here. Mm -hmm. That's why you will hear uh, white women, feminists, uh, uh, homosexuals and other people will use words uh, 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 and even environmentalists, uh, uh, something like uh, uh in, you know, that's the way they used to treat black people. You understand? This is what they, this is how it used to be with black people. You know, like somehow something is over, you know, and that the template, uh, well, anyway, that's, that's uh, something that we hear all the time. I hear it all the time, you know, that uh, this used to be what they did uh, they do to African people. And this is some white person complaining, you know, uh, about being mistreated and whatever, as though uh, we still don't live uh, under uh, oppression, et cetera. Uh -huh. Because you got a civil rights bill, what else do you want? <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Feet. And this will be our last uh, question. And I would like to get just final quick remarks from our incredible panel yes. as well. Uh -huh. um, great conference. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you were speaking of genocide, Chairman, the one thing that came to mind is our communities are dealing with, um, uh, yeah. are dealing with um, um, bullying. Bullying and genocide are the same thing in different levels. That's yeah. Well, one thing is bullying and stuff is a is a relatively recent concept they use to uh, really uh, exacerbate and and uh, and sometimes incite contradiction between the people. Mm -hmm. You know that somehow bullying. I mean, stuff. You know, you call him bullying and shit. That's part of a whole transition that human beings always go through in terms of development and growth and what have you. As you just do that stuff. You know, you just deal with it as you're on the campus and stuff like that. And, uh, that happens and what they characterize as bullying. They've given it a certain kind of character now and it inflames and incites contradictions yeah. between the people. Sure. And so you got people fighting against bullying. You got bullying and what have you. Nobody's, the bully is never the principal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and never the ones who run the joint. You understand? It's the yeah. people are always bullying each other, et cetera. And that's a, it's a diversion. And it's not to say that people don't do bad things on, on campuses. I mean, you, you, 
Where, where they, where, listen, you can reflect now and say, wow, I was bullied, but you didn't call it bullying when it was happening then, you know? She don't like me and she did such and such a thing and you tell your friends and y'all, you know, you deal with it. You don't associate with them, et cetera, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, or you go tell their mom. You know, I mean, uh, this whole bullying stuff is uh, something that they've created to inflame and incite contradictions between the people. And uh, again, there is no such thing as principles bullying you. That's the, the bullying I saw was this goddamn principal, you know, or the school teacher yeah. uh, who yeah. told me that before black people can be free, that we have to prove ourselves to white people. That was a bullying sucker. And I tried to argue with him. And of course, he held, he controlled the mic. So, you know, uh, I was not very successful in that. But that's what I'm thinking, uh, comrade. And uh, but if you uh, try to uh, apply the fact of, of, of terror and stuff being imposed to the people, that's that's a whole different thing. That's the difference between horizontal and vertical violence. Vertical violence comes from up top, from the ones who oppose everything. And horizontal violence often happens between the people. And the horizontal violence usually is a result of contradictions that's been posed on the community by vertical violence. Yeah. The principal, <laughs> who you'll never deal with, and the school system, uh, who stick us in these horrible circumstances. Right now, you've got a situation where uh, 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 they got police on campuses. There police on campuses, yeah, 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 because all this shooting. But who doing this damn shooting? Yeah. You understand the police? They you saw when did you see police on campuses? You saw police come on campus with desegregation when African yeah. you know, uh, when white students and white teachers are bringing their little white asses over to the African community with desegregation. Then you had to have the police there to protect the teachers and the students from this illusory, illusory uh, 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 horrible black population, etc. Yeah. Yeah. This is when you begin to see that, yeah. yeah. Well, hold up. Let, 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 uh, I know this comrades there. We've hogged it, y'all. We back like the like the colonizers. I know. Well, I, <laughs> I just really want to salute the incredible panel yes. that we had today. This was amazing, and I I know that we have to wrap it up. I mean, we're we're way over time. I know that, and I just wanted to know if each person could do like one minute, that your final, just a final statement to close out today. And I see, um, I see Comrade Afia on on the screen. Okay, I would, uh, I in closing, I would say, despite the uh, inadequacies of the UN and the international uh, structure, that we must be present. We must never cede any ground to the yeah. enemy. If we are only there for the purposes of emphasizing and preferably ideally heightening the contradictions, we must always be present. Yeah. So let me say more than that. I'm sorry. We're going to extend this just a second more. Yes. Because you know, I called you the other day, coming to fear, and we right. didn't finish this discussion. But we are going to extend it. And we, we're looking forward to your being a really powerful uh, part of, a, of a, I think, a new and innovative process that we want to initiate uh, in that international arena, uh, creating a whole new kind of, of mass movement uh, that will bring people into that arena on different terms than, than what we've been able to do up to now. So that's what I want to talk to you about. I'm not saying too much about it now. Because otherwise, next thing I know, I'll be hearing some other great <laughs> leader who. <laughs> I, I look forward. I look forward to the discussion. Splendid. <laughs> so much. Very powerful. And um, Akira Tafari and Director Akile, they're not on. Okay, they're not back on, but I just, wow, what a powerful, powerful workshop today. This has been incredible. And I just want to end by saying we are winning and unity through. Revelation. Yeah. Black power, comrade. Black power. Black power. <laughs>
But no, Elsa Minor, Elsa Minor, you know, Elsa Minor brought the struggle of uh, of uh, in solidarity with the Palestinians to SNCC. Oh wow! Well, she had yeah, been you know, you know, you yeah. you you tell that story, but actually, it was the Atlanta Project. It was the Atlanta Project. Prior- the Atlanta Project in the position paper, which challenged the presence of whites in SNCC. Right. The, mm-hmm. It challenged um, SNCC to um, take and not just make a statement, but to actually formulate a program um, in response to the U.S. war on, um, on Vietnam. And as a part of the commitment to uh, liberation struggles around the world to include the Palestinian struggle in that that list of struggles. And it was Ethel who picked it up after the Atlanta Project and put it in uh, the, the paper, the, the article that you described. Yeah, the yeah. newsletter, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ethel had been a member of Malcolm's organization. Yes, that's, that's right. Malcolm's organization, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but so was uh, people. So were people like uh, Askia connected to, uh, and and uh, uh, close to Malcolm X, if I'm not mistaken. My, yeah. Askia Muhammad, who was one of the the authors of, uh, of that document, wasn't he? That's true. That's true. Yeah. That yeah. is true. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Uh-huh. All right. Yeah. yeah. They they're gonna fire me if I keep yeah. talking. Yeah. Coming <laughs> in. Uh-huh. Just uh-huh. Out now. Yeah. <laughs> Jesse, he's not going to be responding. You're not going to have to put that on Jesse. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we are going to go ahead and go to lunch now. Um, We're going to take 45 minutes, but please keep this discussion going. There's goji bowls by Soul Taco. There are vegan tacos, and we'll come back in 45 minutes. I don't know. I don't know. 